If you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this, people, have you ever had an encounter with cryptids, fairies, Bigfoot, Wendigos, shapeshifters, gnomes, etc., in the woods and outdoors that you think proves their existence? I saw a very tall black silhouette with no hiking gear or backpack go over the top of the mountain directly north of Pikes Peak in about 5 feet of snowpack in the middle of the day. It did this at a pace that most humans would not be able to do on a 45 degree grade in good weather with assistance. I want to say it was the week of March 20th, 2016. I was driving down from Pikes Peak when I and my family saw it. Four of us. I suppose I caught it maybe 20 to 30 feet from the point at which it topped the mountain and went over the other side there was a snowboarder pointing at it to his friend on the same road. I wish I'd stopped talking to them, but I did not feel comfortable pulling off the shoulder in that area. There are no guard rails. It stayed a black silhouette even at the top of the mountain in bright daylight. The road I was driving down was just about where the tree line ends, give or take 100 feet or so. Probably the most compelling thing to happen to me that makes me think Bigfoot might be real was being about 15 miles deep in the mountains during deer season. To get to my stand, it was about another 5 miles or so from where we were camped, down an old logging road, and about a 1,000 yard walk down a trail to a salt lick in a small valley. As I was walking to my stand, a rock hit my ankle, and I panicked and ran as fast as I could until I got to my stand. Once I got there, I calmed myself down, realized I probably just managed to kick it into my own ankle, and stayed for a few hours. Once it was time to go, I started my walk back out, and near the mouth of the trail, I heard a rock hit the ground near me, and then I got smoked in the thigh hard enough that it left a bruise. Again, after I calmed down back at camp, I decided it must have been another hunter that I walked up on, maybe. The only thing that doesn't make sense to me is that all the way down my trail were pine thickets and thick briars on either side, nowhere that someone would have been hunting. Not much else makes sense. That next year, my cousin and I both got hit in the face with a ridiculous amount of gravel while we were riding the four-wheeler back to camp from scouting other spots. Neither of us know what it was, but he never made fun of me again. The following year, during muzzleloader season, I stopped to pick him up from his stand on my way back to camp, and he was tense. I asked him what was up, and he eventually told me that he could hear what sounded like a grown man crying around him in different spots every few minutes and that he was glad that I picked him up when I did. It happened back on December 27, 2019 between 1745 and 1800 hours. I live in the UK but I'm of primarily Irish heritage on my father's side, and my family has been living in the locale for roughly four generations. Anyway, there's a hill I had to walk up after work to get to my home from the station, and at the top there's two Victorian lamp posts, on the right, a couple of houses alongside the steep embankment that is a dell with a tarmac understory, and to the left, woodlands, mostly oak and beach. Anyway, at the lamp post closer to me, I could see a figure struggling to climb it. At first, I thought it was a rat, short-sighted, wasn't wearing glasses, but as I got further and further up, it started to look more and more humanoid. I'm in ducking shock at this moment, and a bunch of correlations come into my head, then it rests on fairy. I laughed my ducking ass off at it due to the absurdity, and I literally shouted, go duck yourself, you ducking fairy, because I was just in disbelief. Two seconds later, this clap, bang, or explosion goes off at the back of my head, and it knocks me to the ground. I just started running, and I got the duck out of there. I had no bumps or injuries on the back of my head, and the sheer force of it is just unexplainable. I honestly would have shrugged off the event if it wasn't for that. It was supposed to be a routine camping trip. My wife, two kids, and I have been doing this every year for as long as I can remember. There's something special about camping in the fall, the leaves turning amber and gold, the crisp air, and the sound of twigs crunching underfoot. But this year, something sinister has found us. We set up camp in our usual spot, a clearing by a small stream. We were all excited to spend a few days disconnected from the world, just enjoying nature and each other's company. We roasted marshmallows, played board games, and went on hikes. Everything was perfect until the second night. I was awakened by a strange noise outside our tent. It sounded like something was dragging itself through the underbrush. I assumed it was a deer or a bear, so I shook it off and went back to sleep. But then the noises continued, growing louder and more persistent. I tried to ignore them, but they kept getting closer and closer. That's when I saw it, a grotesque creature, unlike anything I had ever seen before. Its skin was mottled and leathery, its eyes were black and soulless, and its limbs were twisted and gnarled with horrifyingly long and thin fingers that ended in razor-sharp talons. It stood at the entrance to our tent, staring at us with an intense, unblinking gaze. I tried to scream, 
but my voice caught in my throat. My wife and kids were awake now, huddled together in fear. The creature didn't move or make a sound, it just stared at us, as if it were studying us. The next few hours were a blur of terror. The creature didn't attack us physically, but it tormented us mentally. It whispered horrible things in our ears, things that made us doubt our sanity and question our grip on reality. It showed us visions of our worst nightmares, playing on our deepest fears and insecurities. We were trapped, helpless, and alone in the middle of the woods with this monster. We couldn't run or fight back, we were at its mercy. It was like it was feeding off our fear and desperation, growing stronger with each passing moment. Finally, as dawn began to break, the thing retreated back into the woods, leaving us shaken and traumatized. We packed up our things and left the campsite as quickly as we could, never looking back. That experience changed us all in ways we couldn't fully comprehend. We stopped going camping and stopped seeking out the beauty of nature. The memory of that creature haunted us, a constant reminder of the darkness that lurks just beyond the edge of our perception. It was a hot summer day in upstate New York, the temperature was high, but ice cream or a quick jump in a watering hole would make it perfect. It was maybe 10 o'clock to 11 a.m. when we went to a watering hole. I was hanging out with my best friends, Andrew and Thomas. They were twins. After messing around at the watering for two to three hours, we went back to their house. We were on their Xbox and our phones for half an hour, and they played football for an hour and eight. Their dad was a really fun person, so he asked us if we wanted to go for a ride on his big at V. My brother stayed by my side, but my dad got shotgun. The at V had a wagon at the end for us to sit in. The wagon was really big, but we were still really cramped. He went around the neighborhood to show us until he pulled up to a pond. Before the pond, there were boundless train tracks. After hopping over some puddles, we walked up to the pond. After, my dad tried to check it out, but Thomas heard a buzzing noise. I thought it was just a bee or something, but Andrew told me he heard a faint roar that sounded like an amber alert. I was a bit concerned, but I tried to shrug it off. That was until Thomas started walking down to the ad V. I was five feet behind him, and I saw his jaw drop. I was confused, until I walked down and saw it. It was tall, 40 to 60 feet, which is what I would estimate, but I am not 100% sure. It was skinny, with long arms and legs, and it had two sirens at the top of its head. Andrew came down a couple seconds after me, and then it started playing siren noises. A couple swears were thrown, and I called my dad. Andrew's dad came down first, and once he came down, it started backing up and disappeared into the woods. When my dad came, it was already gone, but he told me that he heard the sirens too. We left instantly and reported it to the police. They said it was most likely a tree or an art project. All of us were scared, but Thomas was the biggest. When he was younger, he had autism and depression. We are still best friends, but we don't really talk about the incident. Recently, my family moved into a house in northern Alabama. Our home is surrounded by woods with some of the tallest trees I've ever seen. The closest house is probably half a mile away. Our house itself is pretty creepy, a faint blue color with a very old wraparound porch and an old red door. Our house is surrounded by trees on the sides, but not as many in the back. There's some trees, then a giant empty field. Well, the other night, I decided I'd go ahead and make a bonfire and burn some of the trash and pieces of wood that were just thrown around the yard. I busted out my fold-out chair, cracked open a beer, and rested my legs on a tree stump. All of a sudden, I start hearing this clicking noise coming from the left side of the woods, those annoying click noises kids make with their tongues sometimes. I brush it off and just assume it's a strange bird or something. Then I start hearing it again, but louder this time, almost like whatever it is wants me to come check it out. Anybody out there? I ask silently. Click. 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 I decide it's just a bird, and I walk over to my truck to turn on some music. I sit back down and try to relax when I see the trees moving on the right side of the forest. I get nervous, but not being the supernatural type, I just chalk it up to a big dog or something. The fire starts dimming down when I hear a new noise, it almost sounds like someone whispering anybody over and over. I think maybe it's interference with the radio, so I run over to it to turn it off. Then, as I'm reaching into my truck, I hear loud footsteps behind me. Anybody. Anybody. The voice whispers. I look around and can't see anyone, it's so dark outside, just miles of trees, and my house is far out in the distance. Then I see something peering out from behind a tree. I squinted so hard to make out a shape, whatever it was, I saw it. It starts crouching lower, but it's so tall and skinny that it makes me sick thinking about it. It wasn't human, I don't know what it was, it got on all fours like it thought it wouldn't be seen anymore. 
I stupidly start to walk towards it when it runs off around the fire into the woods on the other side of my truck. I quickly run to my chair and grab my cell phone, then sprint to the truck. I jump into the truck while looking down at my phone to dial 911. 911, what's your emergency? There's, there's something outside my house, it's outside with me, it kind of looks like a tall, naked man. We will send an officer your way, sir, please try to find somewhere safe until we arrive. Hurry, I think it's watching me, please, then I hear it, that clicking noise right in my ear. I look over, and it's in the truck with me. I don't know how I didn't notice it, it's so dark that I couldn't see it. I tilt my phone up to shine the light more on the figure while keeping the rest of my body completely still. Its eyes were moving so fast, like it was absorbing everything it could, its ribs were protruding from its body, it has blood on its hands and under its long fingernails, it doesn't have any hair on its body, it's just a dull grey. I quickly jumped out of the truck and sprinted for the back door. I didn't hear it following me, though. I get inside and lock the doors, then I look out the back window to see it standing and looking at the fire, its head down and twitching, then it slowly looks up at me and points. The cops arrived at nothing, I couldn't fully explain what I saw in fear of them thinking I was completely insane. If anyone has any idea what this thing could be, please help me. I know a lot of you on here know what you're talking about. I'm scared for my family, and we can't afford to move again. First off, this is my mother's story, but we're all very unsure of what it was. Hopefully, one of you will be of help. So here it goes, my mom was driving my uncle to work, he usually has to leave at about 4 in the morning, so it was quite early in the day when no one was on the roads in our area. Keep in mind that what I'm about to describe to you, both my uncle and my mother saw. As my mother pulled around a curve, she saw a tall, very lanky man. He was dressed in all white, she said. He had reddish eyes, and he was holding what looked to be raccoon fur. She said that in order to not hit him, she began to swerve away from him, but as they drove past him, he looked at the car and began to dart full speed at it. Naturally, out of fear, she sped away. She told me that my uncle and she were both scared SHT and couldn't believe what they saw. On her way back home from bringing him to work, she said she didn't see the man, something? At all. I read up on a story on the internet, I came face to face with a massive figure with red eyes, and my mom said it describes the same thing she saw with similar mannerisms, but this is the only thing I found describing it. If anyone could please clue us in on what this might be, it would be great, because we are all very unsettled by it. A few months ago, one of my friends opened up to me about a creature he said he encountered two times around New Jersey, where my mother lives. This same friend and I have encountered a skinwalker in the past while being in New Jersey, and he told me that when he was just a boy, he saw something in the fields next to his house. Whatever he saw still terrifies him to this day. He's had two encounters with this creature, one in the middle of the day when he was a boy and one waking up in the middle of the night. Here are his encounters with an alleged dogman. These stories are also from his perspective. I've lived in New Jersey all my life. Since I was a kid, I've had all sorts of paranormal and creature experiences for a long time. Here are two of my encounters with what I think are dogmen. It was a clear, sunny day as I was walking alongside a trail that was close to my house. I was only about 7 or 8 years old at the time. It was so beautiful out that day, and as a young kid, I was taking it all in. I was having an adventure, picturing myself just running through the open fields, waiting for mom and dad to get home. The trail I was on had beautiful scenery all around, with tall grass and miles of fields to my left and dense forest to my right. I was just walking through the woods, as whenever my parents weren't home, that's what I used to do. I was enjoying the walk, taking in all the sounds of nature. The smell of the woods was intoxicating, as were the chirping birds. Then the woods fell silent. I felt like someone or something was watching me, and my eyes darted around the entire area. I then looked to my left and noticed something in the tall grass. To me, it looked like a big dog, but then I saw it was crouched down like a man would be if he were hiding. It was covered in brown fur, looked like it had a muzzle and ears like a German shepherd, and had eyes that were blood red. I thought it was more curious than frightful to me, but I was still on edge. I was scared for a bit, but I acted like I didn't notice it and just went along with my day and ran back to my house. I never spoke about this encounter with any of my family, as they would think I'm crazy, but that was my first encounter with what I think was a dogman. The second encounter only happened about 4-5 to five years ago. At this point, I lived in a different house. This house was close to a large forest, and the biggest predators I've seen around here have been either coyotes or foxes. What I saw that night was no coyote. I woke up in the middle of the night with my throat dry and realized I was thirsty. I went to the kitchen to get some water when I felt a sudden sense of dread and felt like I was being watched. 
I looked into the window close to where I was, and to my horror, I saw this huge animal in my backyard. Whatever it was noticed me, and it was staring at me with these crimson red eyes. I felt utterly terrified, and to my horror, I saw the animal bear its teeth at me and stand up on two legs. This creature then started growling, and I could hear it as my window was open slightly. I also saw its breath come out of its mouth, and I realized that this was a real animal. It looked to be about 7 to 8 feet tall on both legs, with the head of a German shepherd and a body shaped like a bodybuilder. Whatever it was, I then looked at the fence in my yard, ran to it, and jumped across it into the woods below. I went back to my bed, terrified, and couldn't sleep at all that night. These two encounters with these beings have shaken me to the core and made me realize that there are creatures that science refuses to recognize. Irish here, living in Ireland my whole life, I have quite a few. 1. When I was about 7, I was staring out my back window from the upstairs landing in my old house. I was mesmerized as I looked out. Usually I would see the backyards of other people's houses and the great big grey building, which was the handball alley. I squeezed my eyes closed and opened again because, in the usual place, the surroundings were just fields of beautiful green grass, soft rocks dotted around pools of blue water, and flowers upon flowers swaying in what appeared to be a gentle wind. It's very strange. I've never seen this before, I thought to myself. Then I noticed a movement in my backyard. What I saw next startled me. Sitting on our defunct flower bed was a man the size of a baby doll. He was wearing green trousers, a waistcoat, and a jacket, and what always stuck with me were his shoes. Black as the ace of spades with two big shiny gold buckles. He was sitting there looking at his shoe when his head bolted up. He looked at me, then smiled and vanished. The view behind my backyard turned back into its mundane self. To this day, I don't know what happened, how it happened, or can't make head nor tail of what happened but I'm glad I got my first and only leprechaun experience. 2. My partner's house, which he grew up in, is in rural Dongle. By rural, I mean surrounded by mountains, water, cows, sheep, one church, and no shops. It could be a great setting for a horror movie at night because it's that quiet. Neighbors are very far apart, so the chance of the neighbors hearing you scream is very slim, may I add? Now you get the idea of how rural it is, so now I begin to tell the tale. It was 3 a.m., the witching hour, and my partner was lifted out of bed by the sounds of laughing and giggling. He said to himself, my mother and father are out cold, who is making the noise? He strained his ears to listen, and what he heard next was amazing. Drumming, a bit of fiddling, the pipes calling, and the important part of hearing great Irish music was the singing and laughter out of the people enjoying it. He got up to see what the commotion was, and as he walked around his bungalow house, his parents sounded asleep. He walks out the front door with nothing but peace and quiet, like expected. He walks out the back door and hears the sound. He follows the sound and is led to the edge of his garden, which backs onto a field with a mound. He shone his torch on nothing. He felt like the noise was coming beneath him, so he got down and pressed his ears to the ground. Lo and behold, the sound was coming from under the ground. The general direction for the party and music was in the small mound or hump in the field. He freaked out, skided back into the house, and leapt into the bed. A couple of weeks later, I was reading a book on Irish paranormal and fairy stories, and lo and behold, the one place that was continuously mentioned for fairy sightings was the area where my partner lived. Appalachian, not deer. When I was 12 or 13, I was playing with sticks around the tree line of my property, as one does as a 12 to 13 year old boy. It was probably 6 colon 30 ish, as it was light enough to see into the woods as a group of deer that frequented my yards was going by. Thinking nothing of it, I continued to play until, about 10 or 20 minutes later, a bear walks through the woods. I froze, staying as still as possible in hopes he wouldn't notice me, bears were rarely seen in my neighborhood, as it wasn't full rural or full urban, but a mix. After 5 minutes, he disappeared into the trees, and I turned to head inside when I heard the sound of a bear dying painfully. I ran back to my house, slept it off, and my grandfather and I went out to look over the area. When we found the bear, it had been absolutely shredded, as had the two deer next to it. One of the deer was a small doe with a long neck and knee joints that looked broken backwards. We called local wildlife services and were never trusting of the forest behind our house. We continuously heard weird and alarming sounds from the woods until I moved out. I live in Iowa now, but I never trust a West Virginia forest, you never know what's out there with you. I'm sharing this on behalf of two of my friends. This encounter happened 10 years ago. They were walking the trail one late night in Pugsley Creek Park. They reached a part of the paved trail that was behind IS-174, which is a pretty straight path. 
they each heard something walking behind them, and when they turned to see what it was, they said it was a white creature walking slowly with frog legs. They said the knees were bent backwards, and frog legs were their best interpretation. They were each startled and just kept walking when the creature zoomed past them with great speed. They said when they first saw it, it had to be about 40 yards away, and it looked pale or albino, but when it passed them by, it wasn't running, it was jumping forward and eventually jumped into the trees a few yards ahead. One friend ran to see if it was in the trees and could not see it, even though he mentioned it was very pale and had some size on it. According to him, it had to be about 8 feet tall. This happened a few years ago. I'm from Ontario, Canada, and the number of trails out here is astounding. The set of trails I walk on a regular basis cut through the city I live in and run along the river. There's plenty of wildlife, and on a few occasions, I've sat and watched deer along the riverside. Whatever this was, it was unlike anything I'd seen before, even if it was only for a brief moment. It was the summertime, so my friend Kendra and I were out on the trails while the sun was setting. It was getting dark, and because of how dense the trees and bush are along the trails, it was getting harder and harder to see even if the sun hadn't set completely. I had my phone flashlight out so we could at least see the trail. I also had some music playing. I had stopped for a second to change the song, and Kendra suddenly goes, what's that? After a series of noises broke out beside us, slowly, I turn my flashlight toward the bush on the left side of the path. The light shines on this large, white figure. It was so white, it was pretty much reflecting the light I was shining on it. It was walking on four legs and was way too large to be a deer. Too white, too. From what I remember, it had skin. No fur. It wasn't a dog. If I could describe the texture in the short amount of time I had between looking at this thing and booking it, it was almost rubbery looking. This was all I could take in before it ran off in the opposite direction of where we were looking. I didn't stick around for very long either. Same could have been my last words before the two of us took off running. We joked about it a lot, saying we saw the rake and that my last words would have been same. I surprisingly didn't feel any fear right away. The fear didn't set in until after we ran away from whatever it was. Maybe that came from the sudden shock of seeing this white figure running away through the trees and brush. Needless to say, I don't walk those trails at dusk anymore. I am a 20-year-old male. I live in the lower half of Oklahoma, about an hour away from OKC. I work at a fast food restaurant with a very high turnover rate, so needless to say, I've met and talked to several interesting and odd people we've hired. However, I have always been very personable and love getting to know people by asking them questions they may not normally be asked. One day, Jesse and I were both off and began talking about the supernatural and how, even though I'm a skeptic, I still love people's stories when, out of nowhere, they get really serious. His face goes slightly pale, and he says, I have a story. By his sudden change in mood, I could tell he was serious, he was usually such a bubbly guy. Jesse happened like this. One day, Jesse and his friend, let's call him Phil, were skipping school, as rambunctious kids do, in the same area we now work in. Phil's father owned several properties, but one in particular never really got used much. It was a plot of land with maybe 30 acres of land on it, mostly sparse trees and grass. But the thing about this property was that it had a house on it, one of those old 50s, 60s, or 70s houses that looked like the people just up and left one day with no reason or belongings, they just left. Being bored and out of anything else to do in rural Oklahoma, they thought it would be a good idea to go explore. It was about 3 in the afternoon, and it was a bright and sunny day. They traveled down the dirt road to the house, arriving there shortly. They got out of their truck and walked the path leading to the house, moving the gate as they entered. The house itself was a two-story old country house with a big porch and a somewhat sizable living room, it seemed. They both walked up the creaky porch, each step letting out a loud ee as they moved. Phil decided to explore the inside, while Jesse elected to explore the outside and porch. Phil went inside, leaving the barely hinged door open, while Jesse looked around. Exploring the porch, he found nothing of interest, so he hopped off the porch and began walking around the side. As he did, he said he began to hear some sort of heavy breathing and heavy footsteps. Thinking it was only Phil, Jesse continued around the house, now halfway around the large house, when he suddenly heard the loudest bee he'd ever heard, he froze. Phil's father never used this land, let alone for livestock. Why would there be a goat out here? Before Jesse could move, a figure slowly walked around the corner. It was tall, 6 feet 8 inches or taller, and very lean and buff, he said. He nervously looked up at its head only to find a more off-putting sight, a goat's head on this muscular torso, looming down on him and very obviously looking right at him. Jesse snapped out of it and bolted back towards the path they came from, 
screaming the whole way. Phil, hearing this, ran out of the house, yelling, What? What? What is it? When he must have noticed the figure, now closer to the porch, just staring at him. Phil took off too, catching up too, passing, and tripping Jesse. No joke, tripping Jesse in hopes of better chances of survival, maybe. Jesse, shaken but not hurt, got back up to continue running, but not before one last look back at the house. All he saw was the goat man, now standing in front of the house, just watching them leave motionless. They both got to the truck fine, Jesse rightly ticked off about being tripped by his friend, and they hightailed it out of there. The moral of the story? Don't trespass on Goatman's property, and if you do, make sure you're faster than your so-called friends. I found a small cave while camping this weekend in Flagstaff, Arizona. I went into the cave and had to army crawl about 20 feet before hitting a large opening that had a drop too far or dark to see the bottom. While I was poking around, I held my small flashlight over the expanse to try and see the other side of the cave. There I saw what looked to be two foot long stalactites that were an off white or transparent white. When I attempted to look closer, my light died. I had my wife bring me a larger spotlight flashlight and shine it where I thought the stalactites were, and they were gone. I looked around the cave to see where they could have gone, and the moment I thought I saw them, this new flashlight died. I asked my wife to bring me a cell phone, as mine was dead from camping. My father-in-law offered his, and I began to film the cave. I filmed for about one to two minutes, and then I thought I saw the creature again, and immediately the camera stopped filming on its own. Have you guys ever heard of this? It would have to be some sort of cave-dwelling creature that is very silent, very good at climbing, and somehow has the ability to affect flashlights and cameras. That was very strange. We dubbed the creature Timmy the Tunneler. I'm spending my birthday with my father. Since my mother is out of town on a business trip, I had to spend my birthday with my father alone. My father is a very relaxed person. He is calm and collective and enjoys hunting. I decided that I wanted to go on a hunting trip. I only went with him once when I was little. He seemed pretty surprised, considering I spent a lot of time at home building small wooden projects. It's going to be my first time hunting with a rifle, so my father had to get me prepared. My father took some time teaching me how to hold my rifle, it was really heavy on my arms. My body also fell with it as it fell into my arms. Considering that I am only 15 years old and have never had any experience outside my home away from my crafts, he had a couple rules that were pretty understanding, but the last one kind of shook me a bit. He told me, if you ever hear me say your name, it isn't me, he said that in a joking tone, but I can tell he was being serious at the same time. He never called me by my name. He always told me, anyone can know your name, but not everyone can know your nickname. It was getting cooler outside. Coming down to around 3 p.m. since my father lives out near some woods, it wasn't too far of a walk for us. He obviously saw me tired, so he looked around for a point where we could relax and hunt in place. Over an hour has passed, and nothing has come around. My father told me, I'm going to go take a walk around Dev. His patience was coming to an end. I decided I was going to stay. I felt secure, and all of our stuff was here. Neither did I feel like carrying everything on my back again. I nodded as he headed into the forest. Hearing all of the noises of the forest around me. I was understandably scared, knowing this was one of my first times in the forest. I heard twigs snap all around me, clutching my rifle as I was shaking sitting on this log. After a while of waiting around, I decided it was best to meet up with my father. Heading in the same direction as him, I was still a bit shaken. My rifle was the only thing keeping me from running away. Seeing my father for a few more minutes, following the same path. I slowly crept up on him and said, Dad, are you alright? He turned his head to me, looking a bit frightened, with lost color on his face. My father never gets scared like this, even when he tells me about his past hunting experiences. I was asking what was wrong, and then we heard it. Devin. I was hit with an immediate sense of danger. A wave of fear hit me that I'd never felt before. I wanted to throw up in fear. My father grabbed his rifle and rested it on the rock. He whispered to me, can you see anything? I calmed down and lifted my head up, trying to be as quiet as possible. I looked up, trying to let my eyes focus, considering the circumstances. As my eyes started to focus, I saw a man, but not a man. His body was disfigured, not seemingly looking like a normal human. I couldn't really seem to make out much more. We were about 40 to 50 yards out. My dad told me, whatever that is, it isn't human. My father seemed like he was going to break down in fear, but he held his composure for me. We need to leave now, Dev. He slowly lifted his rifle up and turned around. We were trying not to make a noise as we were going to head back. 
he couldn't catch his footing and slipped. The noise caught the creature's attention, who was still yelling my name, seeming more desperate and louder. I was watching it closely, still not being able to make out its face or anything. Squinting more and more, I saw it. It turned its face toward me. My body was telling me to get out of there now. But I was frozen with fear. I waited for my father to go farther down, as he is heavier than me, so I can move faster and quieter than he can. It fled behind a tree out of my vision, which signaled us to run. I swung my body out of its frozen state. I said in a hurry, run. And my father left me in a full-on sprint, following behind him. My gun fell from me, and I know it was my only protection. I needed to stop to grab it. When I was looking up after grabbing my rifle, it was around 20 feet away from me, and I could make it out now. The figure was tall with very lengthy arms, with hind legs like a dog but much longer. It was a dark brown color with its head shaped like a human, but it's not normal. The creature's face looked more human-like. It stared at me, saying Devon over and over in a comforting tone. I tried to lift my rifle up and shoot, but it was faster. It flew its body at me, covering a heavy pace. I was standing 30 yards away. My father took a shot from afar, yelling at me to get the hell out of there. Pumped with adrenaline and fear. My body was in overdrive. I ran fast, so fast it felt like I was slipping on ice, running past my father. After it felt like ages, I made it to the rest point. I was too scared to know what happened to my father. I was holding the rest point, not knowing whether my father made it or not. As quick as worry and sadness started to fill my body, it was soon at ease when my father appeared only moments after me, he was limping, seeming to look like he had a tussle with whatever that creature was. We packed in a hurry, knowing that it could come back whenever it wanted to. We were taking a fast walk back to our house. Not looking back, we were both breathing heavily as we had our first near-death experience in the woods. When I was around 9 or 10, me and a friend were walking back to her house on a long dirt road with barely lit lamps and so much Brussels and darkness. We were leaving the skating rink at barely the end of winter, and beforehand we were telling stories about ghosts, the paranormal, and such, spooking each other. Telling stories like that at such a vulnerable age brought so much negative energy to us, so as we were walking back to her house in this small town down the creepy dirt road, we saw this weird animal-slash-humanoid tall thing running back and forth at the end of the road for about six times until it saw us, frozen in fear in the dimness of the lamp. My friend screamed, and her little brother was with us too. They started crying as it ran towards us. We ran into another brighter lamp, and I yelled out, in Jesus' name, go away and never come back which I learned from a priest when a demon at Bible camp was ducking with my dorm. I don't believe in God, but that thing, or what I believe we saw that day, was a Wendigo. We ended up calling her dad from her phone, and he drove the rest of the way and picked us up. It was crazy, but it's true that they feed off negativity, fear, and their name to spook you. I also just wanted to say that I do remember hearing it screech as it ran back and forth. I was scared shless. I've lived in Minnesota my entire life, and for about 6 to 10 years, I am pretty sure I was stalked by a crawlers. Mostly sighted around an old, burned out, and overgrown property by my hometown's golf course, I began to see it occasionally on the countryside at night. The scariest was when I was with a buddy at the previously mentioned property. From the entrance on the gravel road, we could see something at the top of a tree on the other side of the lot. My friend was yelling at it and talking SHT when I told him to maybe knock it off. He turned his head back to me for a moment, and when we looked back, it was gone, and we suddenly heard pig snorts from the brush to our left. We booked it from there and didn't go back for a while. The weirdest encounter was with a group of friends driving around aimlessly one winter night. I had gotten out of the car to take a leak, and while I'm doing my business by the ditch, I look up at a line of trees, and in a small break just before the line ends, I could make out something white standing up looking in my direction. Nothing threatening, no noise, just watching from about 75 to 100 yards away. I've told other people about these and other events in the past, and I've always included almost conflicting stories like these. It seems there are or were multiple people around where I live, and it almost felt as if one was aggressive with me and the other just wanted to watch over me. I saw the rake, or something that I call the rake. I can't tell you what it was. I was driving late at night in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. I live 30 miles south of Alamosa, Colorado. I was driving on a back road with my buddy, taking him home near my house. It was about 12 a.m. out of nowhere, this thing appeared in the headlights in the middle of the road. It was crouching over some roadkill. It was humanoid. It was pale. It looked like it had no ears. It looked like a Wendigo from until dawn. It looked like it was 7 feet tall. 
abnormally long arms. No ears. No nose, and some nasty teeth. It wasn't skinny, but its skin was tight, with visible ribs. And like long claws on the ends of its hands, I was barely able to dodge it with my truck, as I was driving considerably fast. As I swerved around it. It seemed like time had slowed down. And it looked up from the roadkill it was eating and stared at me as I passed. Its eyes were yellow. I immediately braked. And yell at my friend, what the duck did you see that? His eyes were wide with fear, and he nodded at me. I threw the truck in reverse, but when I approached the roadkill, it was gone. And he claims to have seen it. So I know I'm not crazy. When I was a kid, I read a lot of stories about the rake. I know the rake isn't real, so maybe they invented a creature that already existed? Maybe it's a cave creature like in the descent? If you have any questions, please ask. I've been doing a lot of research, and I want to find out what this is. I have been obsessed with him. I need answers. I won't stop looking for him. My brother and I have a story that happened during the day, and we're both positive. What we saw was a skinwalker. Here's what happened, we were staying in Wenatchee, Washington State, it was kind of eastern, but not really. It wants to be eastern, but it is not. Anyhow, we were staying with my friend's family while my parents were out of state. My friend's mom, I'll call her Tammy, says to me, will you get your brother? Dinner's ready. To which I replied, where is he? My friend, I'll call her Emily, goes, I think he's by the river, I said okay and went to get him. I crossed the backyard, which is really a field, and prepared myself to go down a stupidly steep hill. The only way to get down the hill was to keep your foot planted on some rocks. Either that, or you fly down. I got down the hill and said that my brother was just chilling on a swing thing. You know, the swings with two or three seats on them? Those things. I stood behind for a minute, planning to push the swing a little and scare him, but I heard my name being called. So naturally, I turned around, thinking it was Emily calling me or something. There was no one on the field. I had and still have a pretty active imagination, so I just brushed it off. I turned back to the swing, and my brother was standing up now. His eyes were fixed across the river, so I looked over too. We saw a deer-looking thing standing on its back legs, and I, again, was just like, oh, my imagination again. I looked away for a few seconds, then turned back. My brother was now shaking. He still hadn't noticed me. The deer guy was still there, but his mouth was moving. It was saying my name. I just barely could make it out, but it was saying my name. I started to shake as well. My brother turned around, ready to run back to the house, and yelled when he saw me. This was the next conversation between us. Me, what happened? Him, did you see it too? Me, the deer? Him, it was not a deer. I don't know what that thing was, but it was not a deer. Me, was it calling my name to you? He said, no, it was calling my name. Me, we can talk about it later, but I was sent to get you dinner five minutes ago. And I know I said I have a very active imagination, but the part that scares me is that my brother does not. And he saw exactly what I saw. And so we went inside, ate dinner, and said nothing of it. We had both relaxed for the most part by the time we got back to the house, and we texted each other about it after so nobody would know but us. About a year after the happening, my brother came into my room and said, Hey, remember that dear thing we saw in Wenatchee a few years ago? I told him I thought about it frequently, and what he said actually scared me so bad that I thought I was going to go into cardiac arrest. He goes, well, I've done some major research, and we could have died if we went near it. It turns out it was a skinwalker. And he continued to tell me about skinwalkers and what they do. I'm not getting into it, but every now and again, we both share a look when someone starts talking about stuff like when Digos and skinwalkers, urban legends, and stuff like that, and neither of us have said anything about it. But my brother decided to tell my dad, who grew up with urban legends and stuff like that, and he also thinks it was a skinwalker. I can still see that evil things face every time I hear about Wendigo and skinwalkers encounters. My brother got a kind of mental effect from this thing, too. I don't want to say it's like PTSD, but certain things around the topic trigger him. He'll constantly have nightmares about it, and he doesn't like talking about it unless he initiates the conversation. I'm a little more thick-skinned around the topic of scary things, but it scared me into thinking I was going to die on the spot. We haven't been back to Wenatchee. So I was living on the top floor of this house. It was remodeled into its own full, separate apartment. I often liked to smoke in my living room, which was a big square with one massive bay window on one side and a super tall pine tree right outside of it. I often watched birds and squirrels in this tree while I smoked, but one day, there were no birds or squirrels. One day I was sitting there, mid-smoking, when I watched this. 
Creature, this tiny humanoid creature, jumped from one branch to another, it came from an upward direction, so I'm assuming near the top of the tree. This little guy was brown. Everything about him was brown. His skin plus his clothes. Okay, look, I know this is going to sound wild, but he wore clothes. I couldn't tell what materials it was all made from, it definitely looked super earthy and organic, but it's neither here nor there. This little brown humanoid creature wore what looked like a little brown cap on his head and some type of brown robe or dress looking thing covering his body. Bare feet. Also brown. He was maybe 5 feet away from me, literally just outside the window, and I watched this guy jump from branch to branch, jump onto the branch that was eye level with me, walk along the length of the branch towards the trunk, hop and swing to grab the trunk, and slide half a foot down to the next branch, then jump from branch to branch again until he hopped down and out of my view. All of this happened within no more than 4 to 5 minutes, and I just stared out the window for a while looking for him. I was absolutely shocked, and my mind boggled. Also, this guy was only about a foot tall, maybe even a little under a foot tall. Alright, this happened about 15 minutes ago, just when I was heading home from the cinema. I'm about 4 kilometers away from my house. When I was driving on a poorly lit road, I was looking around into the trees in the dark night when I saw something moving behind one tall tree. It nearly looked like a slender man, but that wasn't really it. Genuinely, it looked like a cryptid of some sort, I'm not an expert in these kinds of things. It had dark skin, long arms, and short legs, a really spherical head, it almost looked like a ball, and menacingly looking red eyes. Scared, I stepped onto the pedal and quickly drove away. When I looked back, it was nowhere to be seen. Right now, I don't know what to think. I don't know if my head was playing tricks because I was tired or something. But it was a really creepy experience. I once saw three creatures on a highway at night that I always referred to as gnomes. It was 1997 in the Midwest in the summer. I was on a state highway that was single lane. It was about 10 or 11 PM, and I was on my way home to meet curfew. I lived only a few miles from the place I saw the creatures, and I was very familiar with that stretch of road. I came up on the top of a slight hill, and then the road was flat. There was a forest on either side. Right when I crested the hill, my headlights illuminated the flat stretch of road, and I saw three small bipedal creatures run from the woods along the highway into the road. They went around in a playful circle right on the road, like a ring around a rose. They circled around twice and then entered the woods on the other side. They were walking on two legs and were pretty small, one to two feet tall. The whole encounter lasted maybe six seconds. I tried to rationalize it and thought maybe it was raccoons or opossums. I lived in the area my whole life, spent a lot of time in the woods, and saw lots of wildlife. I never could figure out exactly what I saw, and anyone I ever told laughed at me. When I was younger, I lived off the grid in the hills of this area for a few years. We basically only left to get groceries every once in a while, so my parents could go to work. One night, on a bright moon, not full, I was sitting outside of our cabin and was bored, just waiting for my mom to get home. I see this pale looking deer walking up on a ridge about 300 yards away. It is walking perpendicular to me and is going from right to left. The moonlight is gleaning off of the deer, but for some reason it seems to almost glow or be whiter than normal. After watching this deer for a couple of minutes, it kind of muddled along every once in a while and dipped its head down. It began to stagger forward, but its forelegs began to shift upwards in front of its body, and the deer itself appeared to get taller, taller than any person I've seen, at least 7 to 8 tall. The front legs shifted to their sides and became what I can only assume were arms. The deer's head began to shift and become more upright in its stance. It stood there for about 5 to 10 seconds, just on its hind legs, balanced and still. Like a giant pale horned warrior or something? Then that was it, I lost sight completely and have never seen anything like it again since. One of the people we were living with was a 50-year-old Vietnam vet and saw the entire event with me. He stayed up for a few hours beating pots and pans to scare it away, no guns. Whenever I share this story, when my friends ask about paranormal or unexplainable stuff, I always give this story because I truly could not comprehend what it was, and most people tell me I saw a skinwalker, but I'm not sure, so what do you think? Christmas night, 2007. At about 8, after everyone had left and the food was all put away for round 2 the following day, I decided to head over to visit my friend in the next village. The drive would be about 10 minutes if I took back roads to get there. So, I did. First, a little background on where my friend lived. It was a housing development surrounding a private lake, you might call it a gated community. You could still drive through it freely after hours by entering one of the four private entry points. 
Since the community was built around a lake, the roads surrounding it took on a sort of spiral shape. The houses were sparsely positioned on the outermost part of the spiral road, closest to the four private entry points. As you drove in further, there were a lot more houses positioned closer together, nearer the lake. My friend lived on the outer edge of this development, so once I reached the entry point, it would only take me another few minutes until I reached his house. His house, along with all the others, were far enough apart that you couldn't see them from the road as you drove by, there were either woods all around with long drives or open fields with long drives. You could see porch lights in the distance, but that was about it. As I entered the development, the speed limit dropped from 30 miles per hour to 20. There were no street lights in the development, and for some reason, I never put my high beams on. I couldn't go any faster than the speed limit because there were speed bumps in place every 30 feet or so for a bit. It was a mild night. I remember having my driver's side window open slightly to take in some fresh air. I remember driving in silence, which was unusual for me, I normally always listen to music when driving. I must have been enjoying the quietness after the commotion of the day. I reached a section of road that had barren fields on either side and woods set back. Houses were probably nestled back into the trees. As I drove, I noticed what looked like someone walking up ahead on the opposite side of the road, coming in my direction. Mind you, I was still going about 20 miles per hour the whole time, so it was probably less than a minute by the time the walker came into clear view. I got a quick scan of it from my windshield before I got my car, and they were exactly parallel. This is what I saw. It was not a person. It stood on two long legs, with long arms hanging down from its shoulders. It was strong looking. Lean and muscular, but not beefy in stature. It looked thin at the same time. It stood at least seven feet tall. It was light colored, I was not sure whether it was white, tan, yellow, or grayish. It didn't appear to have fur, but there was some texture to the skin it wasn't smooth. There appeared to be something coming off its back. I don't know what this was. All I can recall about its face is the small features it had, but the mouth and jaw were notably large, and it had pointed things atop its head, two things going straight upward with something mingled between the two things. That's what I got from a quick scan and from my observation of it as it neared my car. As my car became parallel to it within a split second, I went from looking out my windshield to looking at it from my driver's side window. In that moment, its face quickly peered down at me, and all I remember was the mouth opening wide. Out came a remarkable scream that I'll never forget. It gives me chills just thinking about it. It consisted of a high-pitched shrill or shriek, enveloped by a deep guttural growl. Both sounds happened simultaneously in that scream. I kept driving all the while. This was all happening so fast that I didn't even have a chance to be scared, shocked, or anything. I continued driving, went past my friend's house, and drove home. I called him to tell him what happened and that I just needed to get back. I was probably running on adrenaline to get back home. Later on, I was in total shock after it sank in. Had my driver's side window been fully opened, it would have touched me, or worse, taken me. I'm certain of it. To this day, I still haven't worked out what this was. This happened a couple years ago on a friend's property. His property line comes up to a heavily wooded area where strange stuff is heard at night. We were hanging out in his small shed out back. I had just introduced one of my childhood friends to this guy, and we were chilling when we heard his pit bulls going crazy, barking, and growling in the woods. Then an extremely loud, high-pitched shrieking came from the woods, which made my childhood friend jump. As soon as the shriek was heard, his pit bulls came running, one of them hiding under my chair. Then, a minute or two later, we see three sets of very large, opalescent eyes staring into the shed we started hearing small shrieks as they moved closer to the shed. I could just barely make out a completely white, gray, bony form before my buddy told us to cover our ears. As soon as I covered my ears, he pulled out an old revolver and fired three shots out the open door, chasing these things off. I looked over at my childhood friend, who looked like he just had a heart attack. My buddy puts the gun on the small table and tells me to take him home, which I gladly did. I've been back over there a few times, and every now and then I hear a shriek coming from the woods, accompanied by my buddy pulling back the hammer of his gun. Around the age of six or seven, or maybe even a bit older, I saw something that could fit the description of a gnome. I was on the top bunk while my younger sister was on the bottom, out cold. We had been put to bed about an hour ago, and I always had trouble falling asleep. While I lay there, staring at my ceiling, something caught my eye by our closet, which was to my left. What looked like a ducked-up version of one of the seven dwarves hobbled through my closet door to the foot of my bed, out of view. This was a distance of about seven feet, two meters. I crawled to the foot of my bed to see where it went, and, of course, 
It was gone. I immediately jumped up and ran into the living room to tell my parents, who were still up. At the time, my parents laughed at my story, which, admittedly, would have sounded ridiculous. When we talk about it now, they tell me they laugh so I wouldn't be scared, but inside they were kind of like, what the duck, that's goddamn terrifying. The gnome was wearing a blue shirt and red hat. It had a big nose and pale white skin. It never addressed me and made no sound. It seemed like it was just passing through. I grew up in the Great Lakes region, which is an area rich in Native American folklore. Upon hearing about the Pukwudgie, I wondered if that's what I saw. My childhood house is on 12 acres of land in a very rural area. So back in 2019, I remember there being a big uproar of unknown creatures roaming the forest, like Bigfoot and Skinwalkers. But this story isn't about them. This story is about probably one of the scariest things I've ever heard about. The Wendigo. A few months after one of my friends, Jacob, mentioned this big uproar, I went to go see him since I had been away enlisted in the United States Marines. I got back after being discharged, and one of the first things I did was go and see him. We're having a good old time, and he brought up the idea of going out to a little hangout spot his now ex-girlfriend took him to when they wanted to get away for a few hours. So I decided why not, so I grabbed my gun, and we went out to this extremely secluded area and started messing around on the old dock that was there. It had been pretty much forgotten by the looks of it, it was poorly maintained, and some of the boards were almost completely rotted through. So about 30 minutes into our shenanigans, Jacob brought up the topic of the Wendigo. The name sounded a little scary, even for me. Curious, I asked him about it. He said that if you went into the woods and said Wendigo three times, you would come across the scariest looking thing you've ever seen. I called his bluff and told him to prove it. To this day, I wish I hadn't. We start walking on this little path that leads deep into the thick woods close to the Alabama state line. We walked for maybe 20-ish minutes and decided we were in a good spot. I feel it's worth knowing that it had been raining a lot over the past couple days, so the ground was completely saturated with water. I turned to Jacob, and he dares me to do it. I stood there in complete silence. The rest of the forest was almost silent as well, besides the tall pines swaying in the wind high above our heads. Reluctantly, I slowly started to say it. Wendigo. 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 Then nothing happened. I let out a silent sigh of relief at the fact that nothing happened. One thing about mine and Jacob's friendship is that we loved it when one of us proved the other wrong about something. In our 10-year friendship, I think it was one of the first times I had proven him wrong at anything. We started to talk a little bit of SHT back and forth at each other when we heard a noise in the distance. Still having the reflexes I had from the Marines, I immediately snapped in the direction of the noises that were just then turning into noises. I started to move closer to the noises, and then shortly after, we saw a few coyotes running across the path, about 30 feet in front of us. I breathed another sigh of relief, but that relief didn't last long since I knew something was up, I didn't know what was up at first, but I just knew it was time for me and Jacob to leave. As we turned to leave the woods, all of a sudden, a tall pine tree started to groan and creak as it started to come down. Noticing this, and in a moment of pure instinct, I shoved Jacob forward as the tree came falling through the rest of the branches and landed right in between us. Jacob let out a cry of terror as the tree landed, and I hopped the tree to get to him. I could feel his heart pounding like a drum as I grabbed him by his shirt and yanked him to his feet. He was still terrified and practically crying as I screamed at the top of my lungs. Move Jacob. Ducking move now. I spun him around really hard, causing him to fall to his knees. I quickly got him up, and we both started to sprint down the path back in the direction we came. I didn't dare look back, and neither did Jacob. I was sprinting through the woods when a familiar sound came from behind me. Jacob. Jacob, come quick. It was the sound. Of Jacob's younger sister, Olivia. He turned and tried to get past me, the whole time he was screaming Olivia. I stopped him and said, Jacob. Look at me. It's not her. Do you hear me? It's not her. Just then, another pine tree started to buckle. I saw it just in time to tackle Jacob down to the ground, as both of us were nearly crushed. I screamed at Jacob once more. Go. Get out of here. Go now. As I was screaming, I pulled my gun out of my waistband and aimed it down the trail in the direction from whence we came. Jacob made it to the opening of the trail, turned back, and noticed I was still aiming my gun down the trail. Bradley, get out of there. Simon hurry. I turned and started sprinting towards him. As I made it into the clearing a good 50 feet, I turned, and I and Jacob both saw it. The thing we had ushered into showing itself. The Wendigo. It stood about 9 feet tall on its hind legs. There was practically no meat on its bones it had really skinny legs and even skinnier arms. Its skin is pale white, 
almost like that of a vampire. But the thing I noticed the most about it were the eyes. A vibrant blue, almost like lightsaber blue for those who have seen Star Wars. Having had enough fear, I raised my gun and fired at the Wendigo. Jacob, not sticking around to see if I had killed it, turned and ran towards the car. I turned and did the same thing as he passed me. That was my first experience with this so-called Wendigo, and I pray that almost every night I never have to encounter something that terrifying again. In the summer of 2007, my husband and I went on a walk around 4 a.m. It started to rain, not unusual for SW Florida, while we were near a parking lot, so we sat under this awning-type structure in an empty parking space. We were quietly talking among ourselves when suddenly I heard a very distinct whistle, the kind that someone makes to grab someone's attention, coming directly from behind me. Startled, I turn my head around, and this thing flies at me and brushes my hair. Obviously, our first thought was insect, but as it hovers just a couple feet in front of us, completely unfazed by the rain, we are able to see its features, and we realize this is no bug. It had dragonfly-like wings with a wingspan of about 3 to 4 inches, but unlike a dragonfly, it had nothing in the middle where its body should have been. We got a very good look at it, and it was definitely just a pair of wings. Nothing else about it was visible. We both stared at it in complete disbelief as it continued to hover in the rain, coming closer, then getting farther, then getting closer again as if to check us out. We were completely speechless the whole time. Then it flew away into the woods ahead, and that was the last time we ever saw anything like that. After it left, my husband, who is a hardcore atheist and makes fun of anything supernatural, whispered to me, dead serious, did we just see a ducking fairy? I'll never forget that whistle for as long as I live. Four of my friends and I hiked up the trails to the view, which now has a bench for people to sit on. You can see it from the observatory, it's basic, right in front of it down the hill. Anyway, my friends got there at about 10 pm or so, I can't really remember, but it was late and really dark. It was pretty normal for us to go up there, it was one of our favorite places to smoke. This time, though, there was what I guess was some homeless guy passing out. We didn't mind, we smoked and talked for a bit, and then we started heading down the trails. We only got a few feet from where we were when we heard something moving behind us. It sounded like something scurrying in the dirt. All we could see was a shadowy figure of what I thought was the homeless guy. He was looking at us weirdly. His head was tilted sideways, like he was examining us. Then he started running toward us, but he was running like a zombie. I'm not saying it was a zombie, he wasn't making any noise other than his footsteps on the sand. We ran halfway down the first hill and stopped. We couldn't really see or hear anything but we could see him in the distance getting closer. We kept running and again waited on the trails. He kept chasing us. I remember seeing him still coming down the trail, running like a zombie. We were about to just jump him, but something was really off about this dude. We ran down the trails as fast as we could. I remember looking up the trail and seeing him run back up to the view. Now, this could have just been some crazy homeless guy, it could have been somebody playing a prank on us, I don't know. But we were up there for about 30 minutes, smoking and talking, and he was just on the floor and wasn't moving. He didn't move until we were a few feet away from him. Griffith Park is supposedly cursed. I'm not saying it was a zombie, maybe it was a ghost. I don't know, but that's what I saw. Four other people saw the same thing. I lived in a small town in northern North Carolina, which was about 10 to 15 minutes from the Virginia border, back when I was in my teenage years. I was around 13 to 14 at the time. I was with my mom, and we were headed to pick up my stepdad at the time, who worked the third shift at a large factory. It was named after another state, like Alabama or Georgia or something. I honestly forget the name of it, but it was something like that. Anyway, that night just ended up being strange as hell. I have a history of seeing and hearing weird things, but never concerning animals. Anyway, on the way to pick him up, a solid black animal ran across the road in front of the car, and at first, I went to warn my mom, who was driving, but oddly enough, she never slowed or even reacted at all. So I shrugged it off and didn't think much of it beyond the first few moments. Then we were parked outside the barbed wire fence since the factory was ringed by it. Only employees could park inside the fence in the company parking lot. Anyone picking anyone up had to park further down this long, winding driveway. It never made much sense to me. The factory was deep in the woods in a hilly region. Heavily forested, basically. I can't imagine employees having a good time walking to the people picking them up in the dead of night. No lights were built along the road either. While we were waiting, my mom had her radio up loud as hell with some song I remember cringing at, and I tried to lose myself looking out the window. Then I suddenly noticed something moving in the woods. I mentioned it was dark. 
I couldn't see much beyond where we were parked except for a short stretch of the road leading to and from the factory. There was no real light except the moon, which, depending on the time of night, illuminated parts of the driveway. So I see this massive, dark shape just moving through the trees across the road. When I say massive, I mean massive. Like a good 15-20 foot tall. It walked on four legs, and I SHT you not, it was shaped like a bear. I can honestly say it was this large because the barbed wire fence was said to be 10 feet tall, and this bear topped it even on four legs. I remember rolling down my window, and as large as it was, I could hear nothing. Something that big should have made noise, right? Even creepier, I mentioned it was nearly pitch black outside, right? I could only see a few feet out beyond the car, right? This thing was so dark that it was darker than the dark outside. I can't explain it, but I could clearly see it moving between the woods on the other side of the road, as dark as it was. I've seen a lot of strange things in my life, most of them unexplainable, but that was my first time seeing things animal related. It just looked like a bear, but it was several times bigger than any bear that could have possibly existed anywhere nearby or on earth. I looked it up, no bear gets close to that size, I still don't understand how something so large made no sound when it moved in the forest. So me and my girlfriend went to Eagle Nest, New Mexico, to do some salmon and trout fishing, but by the time we got settled in, it was already too dark. So I had the bright idea to go hiking in the dark with only flashlights provided by our phones. So I checked maps and saw they had some trails along a river in Cimarron State Park. We went along the Tolby Trail and went around a half mile up. We decided to turn around because we started hearing noises and felt a little uneasy. As we were heading back, my girlfriend stopped and listened, saying she swears she heard something. She shines her light toward the forward part of the trail, and I do the same. We both see some huge grey figure that is way bigger than a bear, and we just bolt. We run for about 20 seconds and look back, and it's still keeping up with us. It then makes a horrible, deep sound that is about the mixture of a sheep, goat, and ram at the same time. We make it back to my truck safely, but then we decide to pull back up to the gate to the trail to see if it was still there, but we see a man on a horse that we didn't notice when we were running back. He never asked us what we were running from or yelling at, and the horse was brown, so it couldn't have been that. We're both confused about what it could have been. We didn't notice any eye reflection when we shined towards it, and I swear it made no sounds when it was following us. It didn't look like a Wendigo or a skinwalker. It was way too large. If anyone knows what it could have been, please let me know. The encounter took place about four years ago. Since learning about humanoids, and in particular about the rake, I have always been very fascinated by them. Back in the good old days, one of my best friends, Robert, would come over for sleepovers. I introduced him to the rake. We always watched horror movies or videos of bizarre encounters, as we loved to frighten ourselves before venturing out into the local woods. I basically live a two-minute walk away from the woods. Until that night trip, we never encountered anything really creepy when venturing into the woods. Sometimes Robert would try to stand still in silence in the hope of hearing something exciting, for example, an animal walking over wood sticks, creating sounds. In order for you to better understand my thoughts later on, I want to give you a detailed explanation of our path. It was after midnight when we headed out. Shortly after entering the forest, there is a small crossing with a left path and a right path. We took the right path, walking up a hill for about a quarter of an hour. After that, we pretty much followed the path, reaching the peak of the hill, and then ventured down again for about 10 minutes. We reached another crossing. The left path would lead us to another exit, whereas the straight path would let us continue walking on to another hill. About half an hour after going up the hill, I told Robert that I wanted to go home as I started to get cold and exhausted. Furthermore, I told him that I did not see us witnessing anything exciting anymore that night. Robert was disappointed but nevertheless agreed. Robert wanted us to regularly stop speaking and be completely silent so we could hear everything surrounding us. We also flashed our lights in the woods regularly. This is where it starts to get creepy. As we started to head down the second hill, we started to relax and talk about other interests. As my, back then, shrimp posture obliged me too, I more or less only looked at my feet when walking. As we reached the second crosswalk again, Robert suddenly scurried up. In panic, he asked me whether I also saw something jump or hush in the woods coming from the right path, the former left path, to the path we originally came from. As I already mentioned, I looked at my feet when walking down the path, meaning I could not have seen anything. However, I believe that Robert just wanted to build up suspension, as he liked to do that when nothing happened on our trips. So I did not really believe him in that. He started throwing rocks in the area where said figure seemed to head, our way back, BTW. We stood still for some minutes, 
listening for any suspicious sounds, but the forest was in total silence. Realizing this, it made me somewhat uncomfortable. On our way back from the second crossing to the first, we started to ease back down again and started talking normally. The walk back also took about half an hour, this is where it gets really creepy. As we were about to reach the first crossing, I used my flashlight on the trees that were not too far in front of us. As I pointed my light at them, I noticed that there were two yellow dots right beside a big tree. As we came closer, I could see it more clearly. These were not just two yellow dots. I started to recognize a bald head with these two yellow, glowing eyes. I told Robert to stand still, and I pointed him to the area where that thing was peeking from the tree. I was furious at him because he did not see it. I told him that he needed to focus on the yellow dots. When he recognized it, he freaked out too. I freaked out even more when I thought about our situation. This creature stood between the only people near the entrance or exit of the forest and us. We really started to panic, as we did not know what to do. As Robert also started to flash on that creature, and we both more or less shouted at ourselves, the creature went behind the tree and peeked out from the other side. As we followed with our lights, it stepped back from the tree. I was able to see more of its body. It was white or gray, hunched over, and its arms were hanging down. It slowly walked away from the crossing, moving one leg, then the other. We stood on the spot for a few seconds. Then I carefully started to peek in the area, and it vanished. I couldn't see it anymore. I told Robert to run for his ducking life, and boy, oh boy, even Usain Bolt would have been astonished by our speed in that run. We ran through the exit and went back to my home. It was the scariest experience of my life. What do I really find so intriguing about this encounter? This creature either followed or stalked us very quietly through the woods for about half an hour since Robert spotted it on the second crossing until the exit, or it was smart enough to recognize where the path we took would be leading us, as we first saw it at the second crossing and then in front of us at the exit. It was also able to recognize it pretty fast when we spotted it. I think by switching sides of the tree when peeking, it wanted to confirm for itself whether we spotted it by seeing us rotate the light to the other side of the tree. Mind you, these were bad flashlights, and the lights only performed worse over that range, last but not least, I do not think it was scary for the slightest of us. Even as I and Robert started to speak more loudly in a stressed voice, it calmly started to walk away. Description of the creature, white or grey body, head looked bald, long arms hunched body posture with the arms hanging down it must have been about 2 meters tall. Rather slim body to give you a better reference, I would love to hear your opinions on this story. Did you also have some encounters with a creature like this? The stack of firewood by my camp would remain unburned until the morning. My camp was a tarp tied up with paracord to the surrounding trees. It was basic but lightweight and easy to carry on hikes. I had built a wall from fallen dead wood held between wooden stakes around the camp to deter any predators. I fumbled for the zip on my sleeping bag in the low light and eventually found it and unzipped it. I took off my boots and prepared to get in, very tired from the day of walking and wood cutting to make my camp. As I climbed in and closed my eyes, I heard a sudden noise from the treetops. It sounded as though every bird in the woods was flying away. A great flapping of wings and the odd squawk of warning prompted me to open my eyes. The embers from the fire were dull now, meaning that I couldn't see any of my surroundings. I have spent a lot of time in the woods and know that it would take a large predator to spook roosting birds enough to fly away en masse. I lay still and tried to listen, but I could hear nothing but the fading flaps of the birds' wings. They weren't nesting again, they were leaving the area. I heard the last of these noises, and then nothing. The woods were silent, eerily silent. I don't know if you have ever spent a night in the woods, but for the first few times, it is quite scary due to the various unexplained noises. Nocturnal animals prowling about, owls, and rodents all make up the nighttime ambience of the woods. Over time, though, these sounds become comforting. There was nothing, no noise whatsoever. I sat up, still unable to see anything. I quietly reached over for a log to place on the embers. They were still hot enough, and the log was dry enough that they would catch. As my hand found a log and I began to lift it, I heard a branch snap nearby. I had made my camp in a clearing so as not to fall victim to tree branches falling in the wind, but all around me was dense, unkept forest. The only path was the route that I had cut out to reach the clearing. The noise came from the path. I sat frozen, my hand straining to listen. There was another crack in the branch. This did not sound like sticks breaking, but a large crack like a branch being trodden on. This has to be a large animal to make such a noise. I strained to see in the darkness, but the embers, while low, still inhibited my night vision. It was then that the smell hit me. An overpowering stench of decay. I gagged a little, trying
trying to remain silent, not wanting to attract any attention to my camp. I then heard a shuffling, whatever this creature was, it was taking the path I had cut. I heard it brushing against the leaves overhanging the trail, the rustling of the low-lying leaves of the trees. Whatever it was, the creature was big, at least seven feet, judging by the height of even the lowest trees. I noticed my breathing becoming heavier and tried to force myself to take controlled, quiet breaths. The smell of death in each breath was so thick I could taste it. That's when I saw the shadow, the unmistakable shape of a deer. I breathed a sigh of relief, feeling silly to have been so frightened by such a common woodland creature that I had encountered so many times before. It stopped moving, and the silence returned. It was so silent, it was almost deafening. It was then that I noticed that I could only make out two hind legs, but the shadow continued upwards. This deer stood on its hind legs, its back stretched straight, and its front legs and paws hung at its sides. This was no deer. My mind suddenly went into overdrive. I consulted a mental image I had made of the area before the light had died, and it was surrounded by dense woodland. It is impossible to run through the night without seriously injuring myself. The only way out was on the path that the creature was standing on, still unmoving. I had not been hunting on this occasion and had not brought a gun with me. I was only camping for two days, so I had enough food and drink with me. I had a large knife, but this thought did not fill me with much hope. I decided that I would scare it away with fire. I dropped the log I was holding into the pit of embers, pushing into them a little past the cooler embers at the top. I quickly placed several more around it and then hurriedly felt around the pitch black floor for sticks. I found a few twigs and threw them on. One of the sticks caught, and a tiny flame shot up from the fire. While small, it illuminated the clearing enough for me to see the creature standing at my end of the path. I could not make out details, but I could see its shape and its antlered head, which was sniffing the air in my direction. The other twig caught, and I saw it. It had the body of a deer, but its flesh hung from its bones. It looked as though it had been decomposing for a while, and yet here it was trying to get my scent. Its torso was upright, and its broken ribs were exposed through the rotting flesh of its chest. The head was the most disturbing, much of its skull was showing, but its antlers had remained intact. Its head hung to its left side as if its neck were broken. Its eyes, or the space where its eyes had once been, reflected a bright red in the light of the fire. It looked as though there was something inside it wearing it like a costume. It opened its jaw, and with its head hanging to one side, it let out a scream. The noise was nothing like a deer, nothing like I have heard from any animal I have ever seen. I felt it all the way through me. A long undulating noise, high-pitched and shrill. My skin felt like ice, and I remember screaming in my head. All care for the dangerous terrain surrounding me has gone from my mind. I couldn't move, I was frozen, sitting in my camp, staring at the monstrosity before me. It took a step toward me when two of the logs caught fire, flames leaping up. The creature stopped and swung its head around to look at the fire, then back at me. It was at this point that I thought I had a chance. The fire seemed to have scared it. I was wrong. It launched itself at me with amazing speed, probably only 20 feet away now. I finally found my ability to move, so I jumped up and sprinted in the other direction. I reached the tree line, and without looking back, I jumped into it, holding my arms up in front of my face to shield my eyes from the many sticks and plants. I didn't make it far, I ran into a large branch and fell over. I wanted to look behind me, but I could not bring myself to. Instead, I scrabbled underneath the branch and started running again on the other side. I hit three more branches in the darkness, and the last one hit me in the chest and wound me. I lay on the ground trying to catch my breath, thankful that I could no longer taste the awful taste of rotten deer flesh. I tried to breathe quietly, trying to listen to the sounds around me. The woods were still quiet, but I could hear periodic crashes of a large creature, presumably searching for me in the darkness. The crashes were off in the wrong direction, though, and seemed to be getting further away, not closer. I lay in this spot for what felt like eternity but was probably about two to three hours, judging by the light. I finally heard a little forest critter scurrying through the undergrowth, then another. Then an owl hoots. It was clear that the predator had left the area. I didn't go back to my stuff. I stood up and headed straight for the nearest edge of the woods. I picked up a large branch as a weapon and slowly picked my way through the woods. I reached the exit at what looked like around 4 am the sun is starting to rise again but is not yet visible. I walked over to my car, it was just as I had left it. I opened the door, and as I did, a smell of rotten flesh suddenly hit me. I slammed the door, started the engine, and drove out of there. My wheels span on the forest floor as I revved the car too hard. I didn't care, I just wanted to be away. I glanced in my rearview mirror. 
Just as I was leaving the parking area, I saw it running across the middle of the parking lot behind me. Its running looked awkward, yet it was still so fast. I put my foot on the floor and didn't look back again. I don't go camping without my gun anymore, hunting or not. My friend Will lives off this highway somewhat deep into the woods, it doesn't take much time to get to his house, but there's pretty thick wood surrounding his house and neighborhood. We were driving home from his house around 11 pm, and my friends in the front seat saw this strange creature cross the road. They said it had a capybara-like face, a very long neck, no tail or ears, walked like an ape, and looked like a human trying to walk on all fours. They also said it had no really defining features and seemed to be disproportionate and unnatural looking in general, and that it had human-like legs. They did not see the feet. It did not have much fur, but the fur there was kind of like that of a short hair dog. It had a large hunchback, like it could stand up and walk normally at any second. My friend will also actually saw a creature of the same description a few years ago. I've been trying to find an animal that it might be, but my friends keep saying that it's not it. I've looked into some popular cryptids like the Wendigo and Crawlers, but those didn't seem right. It had animal features but also some very human-like features. If anybody can offer any information as to what this could be, I would love to know. When I was 13. I was living on a pretty long road called Cherokee Road in Williamston, South Carolina, and this road has been infamous for crazy shit being seen in the woods. It's literally a stretch of road with nothing but woods all around it. Where I was staying was a two-story apartment complex, and next to it was another single-story complex, as well as an old basketball court a little bit further from it. There was also this little house-type building out on the other side of the court, which I'd say is about 20 feet from the edge of that end of the court. Just behind it, it had a really high chain-link fence that had a little pond enclosed inside it all the way around, and then the deep woods beyond it. The fence was so high that you'd have to take time to climb it. So what actually happened? I was out on the phone talking to my little crush at the time, just walking around outside in the dark by the court without a care in the world, because you know how puppy love goes. Anyway, this was around 11 p.m. I decide to sit down by the court in the grassy area just before you touch the concrete. Well, I decided to look up at the little building over across the court, and then my eyes shifted to what I can only explain as this completely white thing standing upright like a human would, but I couldn't make out any real features except that it was pure white, almost glowing with a humanoid shape. By the time I spotted it, it was already running in the opposite direction towards the chain link fence. All this is happening so fast, and just before I duck and hit the jets, this was when I realized that it couldn't have been an actual person. This thing cleared the high chain link fence with one leap. Just one. No touching the fence at all. Once I saw that, I booked it like I was being chased towards the apartments, screaming as I ran up the long flight of stairs up to our apartment. I went inside and was literally running over my words, trying to explain to my mom and sister what I had seen out there. My mother definitely believed it because of the things she'd seen as a kid living out here and out in the country. To this day, I can't believe I witnessed some shit like that because it's only been two other times outside that time that I've even seen or experienced any weird shit out in the woods or near them, but that was the first time ever, and I was freaked the duck out for weeks after that, never going out there in the dark for anything. I hung up on my crush as I was running in and had to make an excuse as to why I hung up, so it wouldn't seem obvious that I got the SHT scared out of me. The only people I've ever told this to until now were my mother and sister the night it happened, and nothing has changed since. There is definitely stuff out there that we'd never be able to understand or explain, honestly. I don't want to. A few days ago, I was walking through a forest near my house that I often walk through when I'm bored. I may have seen something. To my knowledge, when this happened, nobody else was in the forest, but I'm not sure. I heard a growl of bark coming from somewhere, there are coyotes in that forest, but I have never heard one that sounded quite like that, sometimes the things walk up close to my house and make noises at night. Because I was a little scared, I looked around because there haven't been any wolf sightings in the forest, I think ever, and after I continued, I turned my head because there haven't been any wolf sightings in the forest, I think ever, and after I continued, I turned my head because I was looking at a cardinal, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw some large black wolf-like dog run into the bushes. I live in southern Ontario, semi-close to the Grand River. Does anybody know what it could have been? I used to not believe that there was unknown stuff in the woods. I thought maybe Bigfoot could be real, but I severely doubted it. After this happened, I knew there was something unknown out there. I had just bought my first AR-15 style rifle, Ruger AR-556 for anyone who cares, and bought a 60 round drum magazine for it at Gander Mountain while they were going out of business because, why the duck not? Reading up on the drums, I read they were amazing and rarely had any issues at all, this will be important later. A few days after I got it, 
I finally decided to take it out for a test drive, and my sight in my gun was a little better. Here's where everything went to shit. As I said above, Kentucky is super wooded. Three fourths of the land I lived on was just thick woods. There was a main path for driving our gator and a few small paths our cows had made in the woods. I decided to walk along our creek, which had a small path half cleared by our cows. At the end of the path is a big field our cows graze in, and I see guns when the cows aren't there. As soon as I crossed the fence to go to the field, I instantly felt like I was being watched closely. I brushed it off because I've walked back there a thousand times before and never been bothered by anything. So, I keep walking and ignore the feeling of being watched, but at the same time, I'm aware of the feeling. I know I feel like I'm being watched, but I wasn't giving it any noticeable attention. The walk to the field along the creek is a very short one, maybe two minutes at a slow pace. The further I walked, the more intense the feeling got, like I was getting closer to whatever was watching me. About halfway there, the feeling got so intense that I couldn't ignore it anymore. The drum magazine I had with me was unloaded, so I stopped and started loading it. I only brought 20 rounds with me because I was just going to sight in my gun, and 20 should have been plenty. So, now I'm stopped, paying extremely close attention to what's going on around me and loading my magazine. The exact moment I started putting rounds in the drum, I smelled something dead, like it had been dead for a while and rotting in the sun. I started looking around, and right behind me was what was left of a possum. It was torn to pieces. It was almost like it was placed there for me to find. The only thing was that it looked like it had been dead for maybe a day at most, and what I was smelling seemed like it was far more decomposed. This obviously didn't set well with me, so I double-timed it on the magazine loading. I guess I should have taken the dead possum as a last chance to turn around, I decided to keep going. I had never had any problems back there before, so I assumed my brain was just being paranoid. I was almost to the field when I saw it. I was at the end of the creek, and the feeling of being watched was unbearable. Just as I was near the end of the creek and the edge of the woods, I heard a splash in the water. Me being on edge, I immediately turned toward the noise, gun ready but no round in the chamber. Walking down the creek away from me was something I will never forget. At least 8 feet tall, probably taller. Very skinny. Imagine a grown man who weighs 120 pounds. Now stretch him out to be 8 feet tall, but his body width stays the same. It had very long arms, and it walked on two legs. The skin stretched tightly across its body. It made no noise, aside from the splash when it stepped in the creek, while it walked. It also had a very weird walk, almost like a waddle, but taking large steps. But that could have been because it was on a muddy creek bank. It was also a light brown color, almost like the color of a deer. That's all I can remember about it right now. I will edit it later if I remember anything else. Now I know why I felt like I was being watched. Magazine loaded, bolt ready to send a round into the chamber. Remember what I said about the magazine being extremely reliable? I press the bolt release on the gun to chamber a round just in case this monstrous thing decides to attack, I did not intend on striking first. The round gets stuck somehow and doesn't even budge out of the magazine. I had never used that magazine before, so it didn't fail from heavy use. A bolt closing from a gun has enough force to break your finger, so why didn't this magazine work? My only guess is that something had something to do with it. The magazine never worked right again, and I had to return it to Magpul. Needless to say, I didn't tell them this happened, I just told them the magazine failed several times. Anyway, back to the thing. The gun jammed on the first round, which is usually the easiest. The thing books it out of there without running or making a noise. I had just enough exposure to it to get the details I provided about it. Now, for assumptions. It happened in late May last year. I still have the emails from Magpul regarding the drum, so I'm using those as references because, after this, I needed something reliable. As for what the creature was, me and a friend who knows more about this stuff than I do have decided it could have been a ducking Wendigo. The reason we think Wendigo is because everything I described matches them almost perfectly. I had read that they are incredibly thin and tall, have a stench of death that follows them everywhere, which explains the smell of the possum, are very fast, can be several colors, light brown included, and that they sometimes violently kill other animals to scare humans, again, the possum. The only thing that we couldn't come up with was its behavior. Why am I still alive? Wendigos are supposed to be incredibly aggressive. Aside from watching me, it did nothing. It didn't try to attack or confront me, it ran for me like it was scared or trying to draw me where it wanted me. This being said, I have never had another encounter with it. I have gone to the same field, taking the same path, expecting to be watched, and have not gotten that feeling of being watched as strongly as that day. Something was out there, and you can't convince me otherwise.
I've tried to trick myself into thinking I'm being watched out there, and it still has no comparison to that day. For years now, I have lived in a duplex located in a rural country town surrounded by thick, lush forests. It seems rather idyllic from an outside point of view, however, having lived here for so long, I cannot help but feel as though there is something dark creeping, stalking, and taunting our land. For example, I was in the woods one time with a friend of mine, exploring our vast property. The two of us wandered to the property line, a wiry cow fence abutting a large field, when suddenly a small rock came whizzing by my head, barely missing me by an inch, and struck the aforementioned wire fence with such force that it caused a terrible, ear-piercing bang. It had come from directly behind me, which was all my property, so unless someone was trespassing, it couldn't have been anyone aside from family or my friend, but when I looked towards her, she stood still next to me, mouth ajar, just as confused as myself. Obviously, I asked if she had done it, though I had doubts that she had because of her position, and she denied it, saying she had witnessed the rock come from nowhere as well. We looked, and there was nobody, not to mention, no footsteps crunching through the underbrush, which we certainly would have been able to hear if someone tried to make a swift escape. Spooky right? Well, something even more terrifying happened last night, and I require advice. My dog, Bandit, a young German Shepherd Blue Healer mix, has a tendency to get rather skittish at night, especially with the windows and doors being open as of late to let in the cool evening air. Of course, living in the middle of nowhere surrounded by forests, we all assume that it's an animal of some kind. However, this could simply be me being paranoid and not knowing what I'm talking about. Whenever we look to see what he is sensing, there's absolutely nothing, no turkeys, no bears, no coyotes, nothing. We have never heard anything walking around in the woods, you can hear everything out here, including the cows breaking twigs in the field next to us, and have even gone outside to check, but to no avail. So, the other night, my parents were in bed, and my sister and I had recently come back in from a bonfire. My sister explained to me that she had a bad feeling out there due to the distant and sudden howling dogs from the property behind us, hence, she ushered us back inside, but I myself hadn't gotten the vibe, so I wasn't terribly spooked. Bandit began pacing around the house soon after we went inside, going up to a few windows and doors that overlooked our backyard so he could growl at something. Naturally, we were both curious, especially with my sister's bad feeling, so we flipped on the backlight and stepped out onto the back porch, scanning our field. From what we could see, there was nothing, but Bandit was staring towards where we were looking, his eyes and head following something across our yard, like, if he was smelling a distant animal, there's no reason why he would be tracking something, right? He began pacing, still growling menacingly, before I noticed that our fire pit was still alive with some embers, giving me a new anxiety to worry about, causing a forest fire. Despite the eeriness, my sister agreed to join me outside to douse it, and naturally Bandit came along. We opened the back door and stepped out onto the second porch area, but Bandit froze at the top of the steps, staring out into the darkness. This behavior is super unusual for him since he absolutely loves going outside no matter the occasion, but for whatever reason, he was scared into stillness. I myself was freaked out and said, screw the fire, let's go, but my sister had other plans. She lightly pushed his butt forward, gently coaxing him to continue on, and eventually he did, but not without making sure the both of us were right behind him. We were both shouting dumb things like this is our land, be gone and whatnot to keep ourselves cool and collected, which I think instigated whatever it was. Before we could take more than a few steps, Bandit began twisting, suddenly jumping into the air and spinning around towards the darkness beneath our porch before scurrying away to hide beneath our glass table. Truly, I was expecting a bear or coyote to come charging, but even as I gathered all of my courage to look, there was absolutely nothing. My sister went ahead without me because I was frozen in fear, but even as I stood, I scoured our land with a sense of determination, and there was still nothing but us in the forest. In writing, honestly, it doesn't sound terrifying, but just imagine being outside, in the dark, and suddenly your otherwise brave and loyal dog leaps into the air and runs to hide because of something that you cannot see. Of course, once the fire was out, all three of us bolted inside, and as we did so, there were no pursuing footsteps, no howling, no growls, nothing. It truly was as if whatever it was tried to get to us through our beloved dog, and that was its only intention. Even as we entered our home, Bandit was freaked out, continuously growling, barking, and pacing our first floor. At one point, as we were sitting on the couch later in the night, he began to growl at something outside of our open window, as if whatever it was circled the house. I will give you some backstory on who my grandfather was. We will call him G. My grandfather was a very stoic and not easily spooked man. He was an old school believer in common sense and rationality, 
but he also believed there were some things in life that defied both. He told me once, as a child, that sometimes you're just not meant to have answers because you're not ready for them. Later in life, G held a spot on the forests, lands, natural resources, and rural development board of British Columbia in 1991. He served his seat on the Forest Resources Commission as a commissioner. He was also listed as chief forester on the 1955 issuance of BC Tree Farm License No. 1 in the Skeena Valley, originally issued in 1948. He's a credible source who had a lot to lose when these stories came out in his lifetime. As told by my father. His early years were spent on the West Coast, working for Macmillan Blodell, a huge logging and forestry company that ushered in the modern forestry of today. G started working in the forests along the West Coast, starting back in the 40s as a youngster of 10 to the age of 16. Then he left home and went to work on log booms descending the Fraser River, then tugged boats on the West Coast and returned at 18 and ran heavy equipment building roads along the coast, which opened up previously unseen areas of the coast for eventual logging. G worked for Macmillan Blodell as a foreman and bush boss in 1955. The British Columbia Tree Farm Licensing System that is still used today, License Number 1 1955-1959, has G on it. Throughout G's years spent on the West Coast, he traveled to very remote and infamous regions known for their danger. The Nas River Valley is known as the Headless Valley because early explorers and trappers were found dead with their heads missing. Or the Chilkoot Valley, the Pemberton Valley, the Skeena, the Bulkley, the Squamish, and many, many more. G also had a few run-ins with what we call Sasquatch. The encounters with wildlife like grizzly and black bears or moose, as well as unfriendly natives, were not uncommon. Each had obvious telltale signs and evidence that anyone who has spent years in remote wilderness areas can recognize with no trouble. However, there were three events that G kept secret into himself for most of his life, only talking about them on a couple of occasions ever. All of this occurred while he was working for Macmillan Blodell in remote areas. One was in a logging camp setting, the second was surveying a fur road building in the backcountry, and the third occurred deep in the bush while he was running a large bulldozer building a forestry road. All three encounters left G with a profound respect and sense of what to watch out for when discovering the signs of something being very wrong in your surroundings. Encounter 1. G had witnessed for himself the tremendous size and strength of the creature for the first time in 1951. He watched this occasion from a distance of about 100 meters as a large black-haired figure walked across the log camp from one end to the other. The creature, he said, was the height of the top of the cookhouse, which was near 9 feet and the stride was near five feet after later examination of tracks. It walked across the camp in about a minute or so, and when it reached the cookhouse, it had to move barrels full of diesel away from the entrance to the cookhouse. When the weekends came, the logging crews would shut down and would often leave fully loaded fuel barrels stacked in front of the cookhouse doors to prevent the natives and hermits from breaking in and stealing food. The creature picked up the barrels, tossing them aside one at a time without stopping or showing any signs of fatigue. Each barrel, weighing several hundred pounds, is full of diesel. The creature just threw them aside, like we would throw aside an empty cardboard box. After clearing the barrels away from the cookhouse doors, it simply stripped the doors away with one movement, breaking the heavy hinges and leaving the doors on one side of the doorway. It then had to bend over to get under the top of the doorway to enter the back of the storage area. It spent about 20 minutes inside before it must have sensed something, because it rushed out of the cookhouse and headed into the bush in a major hurry. G waited for a friend to show up before approaching the cookhouse. They found the storage room ransacked and the meat locker door ripped off the hinges. Tubs of lard, butter, sugar, and honey were consumed, along with things like chairs, fridges, and benches being pushed against the wall or toppled. The meat locker had been ransacked, bundles of sausages and bacon had been mostly eaten, along with a large ham being nearly half eaten. Bags of flour and baking powder had been broken in half. It took the day to clean up the mess, then they moved the camp 10 miles into another area. Encounter 2. On another occasion in 1954, while G was again in a remote area logging, he and a small crew of guys headed out early one morning to drive survey stakes for laying out a logging road to be constructed. They were walking down along a ridgeline in a natural pathway for game, 50 meters from a river that was just below them. They were walking up a gentle slope that led into a thicket of trees when G noticed, down by the river, at the closer shoreline, what he thought was a bear. Thinking it was a huge bear, they froze in their tracks and dove down to observe and maintain visual contact. G and the other members of his crew had heard strange, loud whoop sounds earlier and thought it was a large and abnormally loud bird nearby. But this black-haired creature at the river's edge stood up on two massive legs, walked about 10 feet, and then let out a very loud whoop call, followed by an inhuman but not of any known beast, a deafening holler, 
somewhere between a growl and a scream. Three of the guys that were behind G dropped their bundles of wooden stakes and hammers and ran back down the pathway towards the crew bus. The other guy that was ahead of G was paralyzed with fear, white as a ghost, clinging to a large cedar tree. The creature spooked at the sound of the three running and began in huge strides to quickly move into the brush, just a couple meters from the river's edge. G lost sight of the creature and feared the creature might try to double back and follow the three that had taken off back down the path. He recalled that everything seemed to be happening so quickly, as he ran up and grabbed the guy by the tree by his collar and then ran to grab an axe that one of the guys had dropped, trying to hurry down the path towards the crew bus. On the way, they were pursued by something on both sides of them in the trees. Each time G stopped to listen for the heavy sounds of something stomping through the bush, whatever it was would stop until G started walking again and then would continue to shadow him in the bush. G also noticed a very strong odor, a musty, rotten smell, which was near sickening by the time they reached the crew bus. G loaded his buddy in the front seat, and with no sign of the other guys, he blew the horn a few times, yelled out their names, and then started driving back to camp. Two of the guys, whom he found on the bolt run, headed for camp up the gravel road. G said his friend, whom he dragged, and the two men they picked up quit the job the day they got back and left the west coast. The last man in the crew is not yet mentioned in the story because G lost track of him when things first began to unfold. He ended up being assigned to return with another man with rifles to look for the last of the three runners. Apparently, the lost track guy had fallen back just prior to the event to relieve himself, and when he saw the three guys ahead of him panic and run, he too took off, not knowing where they were running from, but he saw the look of terror in their eyes. He followed the river to a bridge across the main gravel road about 3.5 kilometers further down and managed to get to where the road they were marking was under construction, then got a ride back to camp. After a couple weeks of searching the area for runner number 3, and with no sign of him, they had to dissolve their efforts and continue the project. They never recovered or found out what became of runner number 3, encounter 3. The last incident happened up near the Pemberton area in 1962. G was operating a bulldozer building logging road. Evening came, and he shut down work and began to walk the machine back to the large fuel tank. It was on a trailer that the bulldozers pulled behind them to their location and then would unhitch from and leave parked while he broke the road for the rest of the day. As he was walking the machine back to the trailer, one of these things, this one at least 8 feet. It walked across the road in front of him, about 100 feet ahead of him. It took the creature two strides and a second to cross. It looked at him, eyes reflecting orangey red in the lights of the bulldozer. Then it went crashing through the trees. G watched as trees 20 to 30 feet tall and 7 to 12 in diameter swayed like blades of grass, the larger trees shuddering as if an earthquake were moving them as the creature moved further into the forest. G knew exactly what it was by then and carried on with his task. He chose to leave the dozer hitched to the fuel trailer for the night, and he drove the machine back further down the newly roughed in road to a crossroads in an open area where the stars and moon could allow for better visibility. He spent the next two weeks building the road and never saw the thing again but he knew that it was probably around watching them. A year later, in 1963, my father was born. In 1964, the family moved from Terrace to Chilliwack, bought an orchard, and got more involved with urban land development. Though he never totally left forestry, he didn't leave the Forest Resources Commission until 1995, when he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. He died in 2000. About a month ago, I went camping with two of my buddies. We went to my favorite spot atop a small ridge. In my area, camping is only legal with permits at designated campsites, so I illegally go camping off trail. The day went normally, and I got to enjoy a nice view with the beginning of fall colors. Once night came, I settled in under a large rock overhang, and one of my buddies set up his tent right in front of me. The other one set up a bit behind us since there was little room, after maybe an hour of trying to sleep, the wind started to pick up. Since we were at the top of a ridge, It got pretty noisy at times with all the leaves rustling. This whole time, I was staring behind the right side of my buddy's tent simply because it was right in front of my field of view. Suddenly the wind picked up again, and for a split second, I looked away from the spot I had been staring at. When I looked back, I saw a tall gray figure take a step to the right. I distinctly heard the sound of the step but didn't hear any other noise after that. Even though the fire was going, it was too far to get a good look, so the only thing I remember is that it looked humanoid. The color reminded me of my buddy's, who was in the tent, grey hoodie. So much so that I thought it was him taking a leak. I was spooked, so I called his name, but his voice answered me from inside the tent. He got out, and I told him what I saw. We both shit ourselves, and it took hours until I finally went to sleep. 
I've settled on it being my imagination or a night hiker since there is a house not too far from our campsite, and I did hear voices at one point during the night, 100% human voices, not some skinwalker shit. I'm basically asking if anyone knows about any grey creatures. I've never heard of anything like that where I live, and I wanted to hear your thoughts. When I was young, maybe 7 or 8, in summer camp, we went camping one night in a forest somewhere about an hour and a half north of my city, and we had a rule that you had to tell a counselor if you needed to use the restroom, out of sight of the campsite but only about a 3 to 5 minute walk away, and take a buddy with you. So I woke up late at night and needed to use the restroom. I woke up my tentmate, and we woke up a counselor, and she told us to go ahead and let her know when we got back. My tentmate and I must have taken the wrong path, as we quickly got lost. We were in our pajamas with only flashlights. We were getting increasingly worried and were wandering around for about 15 minutes, and I knew I was going to pee my pants if I didn't find a way out soon. All of a sudden, we heard a rustling sound in the bush next to us. We assumed it was an animal, but then the rustling continued and was really loud. It started moving forward along the path, and we decided to follow it. I'm not sure why, but it seemed like it wanted us to follow it. The bushes were very thick and very tall. She was definitely tall enough for a small child to stand up straight and not be seen if they were in the bushes. After following the rustling for a few minutes, we reached the campsite. It had led us back. I went back to the counselor, who had started worrying about us, and told her what happened. She brushed it off and took me to the bathroom herself. The next day, as we were about to leave, everyone was gathering by the buses to go home, and the maintenance guy was there. He asked me if I'd enjoyed my trip, and I told him about what happened. He started smiling and told me it was the gnomes. He said there was a community of gnomes in the woods, and they were rarely seen, but they were very kind. They often come out at night, and they are known to pick up trash on the campsite and stuff like that. He said they must have noticed we were lost but didn't want to scare us, so they stayed hidden but still let us back. I told my mom when I got home, but of course she thought he was just trying to entertain me, and maybe he was, but it still seems odd to me to this day. It was approximately two weeks ago, just before Halloween. Now, let me start by saying I'm not an avid outdoorsman. I love hiking, and I've spent countless hours in my city's 16 square mile state park, nature reserve, or whatever you want to call it, but I'm not a mountain man by any means. The park is home to several indigenous mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles and is full of small ponds, thick brush, and even swampy marshes and spots. There are designated hiking and biking trails that sprawl the area but there are also several wild areas that aren't really maintained or used. Being that I have an adventurous streak and that I also hate being around groups of people, I often find myself in these less ventured or wild areas. Now, it's worth noting that I've never really felt uncomfortable in this park. It's kind of like my safe place. I go there to get away, decompress after work, or just to be alone sometimes. It feels like a second home, in some ways. Anyway, enough background information, I'm rambling. I just pulled up to one of the less commonly fished ponds, Beaver Lake, and I intended to circle to the far side, three quarters mile from my truck, on one of the hiking trails that goes right next to the tree line and then into the tree line, and then push further back onto one of the old horse trails. Now, this horse trail in particular doesn't get used much anymore. I can't say why, for sure, but I've heard a myriad of different reasons from different people. The most logical explanation is that it's just not as convenient to get to anymore, and it gets pretty marshy when it rains. I'd be able to follow the normal hiking trail for the first three quarters mile, but I'd have to fork left off of the trail once it went into the tree line. The gate to the old horse trail was about 500 yards to my 9 o'clock from there, just through an overgrown thicket and up a slight hill. I made my way over the four-foot gate and started exploring. I had about an hour and a half before sunset, and I have a strict duck the woods at night policy, so I was watching the time. My main goal for this adventure was to snap some pictures of the area for a project I've been working on and I'll admit, I was more distracted than I typically am. Anyway, close to an hour passed, I'd gotten some good shots, and I figured now was a good time for my egress. It'd take me close to 30 minutes to get back to my truck, and I wasn't keen on getting stuck in an unfamiliar area at night. I sat my backpack down on a stump, dropped to one knee, and started packing and organizing my stuff. I'm not sure what the catalyst was, but I suddenly felt this terrible sense of dread. I slowly turned and scanned my surroundings. Nothing seemed out of place. I stood up and grabbed my bag. When I took a step forward, a leaf crunched under my boot, and I realized that everything was dead silent. Now, as I said above, I'm not an avid outdoorsman by any means, but I know well enough that silence like that is an indication that a predator is nearby, and you need to quickly but calmly make your way out of the area and stay vigilant. It's worth noting that, 
while mountain lions and black bears are not technically indigenous to my area, there have been more than enough caught and relocated for it to be a valid concern. I've been stalked by a mountain lion on one other occasion, and this felt eerily similar, so that was at the forefront of my mind. I've been moving for probably five minutes, and everything honestly seemed fine. I'd lulled myself into believing that I was overreacting and that everything was fine. I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. Good, right? Wrong. By this point, the trail was completely overgrown on both sides. I could see fairly clearly behind me and a decent way ahead, but my left and right may as well have been fall-colored walls. I must have gotten lost in thought for a moment because I tripped on a root and ate shit. As I was picking myself up, I started hearing a soft, I don't know, cooing or chittering off to my right. It sounded like a mix between a dove and a predator. It would start with a coo or yelp and end with this weird chittering sound. I'm actually sitting here trying to replicate it, and I sound ridiculous. I'm not sure my throat is even capable of recreating it. Anyway, I'm out of shape, and there's no way I'm outrunning anything. So I scrambled up, planted my feet, and tried to make myself look as menacing as a fat 22-year-old with a backpack and glasses can look. About 100 yards ahead of me, which would have originally been behind me had I not fallen, so toward where I had taken the pictures and was moving away from, I saw the underbrush start to shake, and it sounded like something was tearing through it. I only had maybe 20 minutes of daylight at this point, and it would take me at least that long to make my way back to my truck. So, I did exactly what you're not supposed to do. Naturally. I turned around, and I ducking booked it, knowing good and damned well that I could run for maybe a half mile. Three quarters of a mile if something's trying to kill me, maybe. I could barely hear anything over my own footfalls and the sound of my heart pounding, but whatever it was was chasing me through the underbrush and gaining on me. It may have been 15 yards behind me at this point, and I still had a ways to go. I don't know if fear kept me going or what, but I reached deeper and just kept ducking running. My breathing got shallow, my vision started blurring, and I was honestly about to collapse when I saw the gate to the horse trail about 300 yards ahead of me. This thing is right on top of me by now, and as soon as I came within arm's reach of the gate, I planted my foot on the bottom rung and launched myself over it. My landing was not graceful. I landed on my right shoulder and tumbled several yards down the hill and into a puddle of muck. I wasn't thinking straight now, and I stood up shakily and started making my way toward the tree line and pond. I knew what direction to go, and I didn't even bother finding the hiking trail. I just crashed through the brush and overgrowth like some kind of barbarian. I didn't care about the cuts and scrapes or the massive amount of noise I was making. My only thought was to get out. The chittering noises had stopped, but I still heard something moving in the brush at the top of the hill. It wasn't trying to be quiet anymore, either. I finally broke through the tree line and could see my truck parked across the pond at the top of the hill. I finally took a deep breath and started slowly walking away from the tree line. The ominous feeling lifted, and I started making my way up the trail alongside the tree line. I was able to catch my breath for about 15 seconds. I heard that God was cooing and chittering behind me again, and I turned to look back at the tree line behind me. So, at the point, there's a trail leading into the tree line in front of me, a tree line to my right, water to my left, and a trail leading alongside the tree line and around the pond to the cars behind me, the direction I needed to go or was going before I heard the sounds again. The underbrush at the tree line ahead of me started to shake, and fear took over. I'm thankful that my bag is waterproof and that my phone is water resistant because I jumped in the ducking pond and swam across it. I've never really told this story to anyone in my personal life. They'd probably think I'm crazy, and I doubt they'd consider me credible. Especially given my interest in Bigfoot and other cryptids. I don't know what was stalking me that day. I know I wound up cold, wet, and a bit shaken up. I also know I've not been back to that part of the park, and I can't come up with a good explanation. Beaver Lake has been off limits to me for a while. I think I'll just continue exploring and hanging out on the slightly more populated side of the park. What do you guys think? So I encountered a werewolf once. People are immediately intrigued by the absurdity of what I'm saying. These two stories happened almost a decade apart, and for obvious reasons, I cannot guarantee they are related at all, but it seems reasonable to at least entertain that idea. The first story takes place at my cousin's trailer, a couple houses down from mine. We live in a rural town at the foot of the Appalachian region, so there's plenty of forest coverage around us. We were playing hide and seek, and all was well until I tagged my cousin and made him the seeker. He hated seeking, so instead of playing the game, he decided to quit and sit on his front porch. The time was around midnight, maybe a bit earlier, so naturally it was pitch black outside and perfect for scaring someone. My cousin's friend, my brother, and I began to devise a plan to get revenge on my cousin for being a sore loser, 
and we came up with this, we lure him to the edge of the forest, and my brother jumps out at him. A very simple plan for a couple of dumb 13 year olds. So we got to it. We managed to convince him that there was something making noises in the woods, and so he came with us to investigate. As we walked along the edge of the forest, we heard something inside walking with us. I looked at my cousin's friend, and we were both grinning, knowing it was my brother beyond those trees. Then, out of nowhere, my brother bursts from the side of my cousin's trailer, screaming and roaring, sending all of us into a fearful panic. He got us good, so good, in fact, that we totally forgot about the noise coming from the forest that could no longer be attributed to my brother. As we were all laughing about the scare, we heard a horrifying noise come from the depths of the forest behind us. It was a loud scream and sounded like a man screaming for help. It slowly changed pitch, and to this day, I swear it said help. After about five seconds of human sounding screams, it turned into the most guttural roar I've ever personally heard. It was chilling. We ran inside, and my cousin opened the blinds to his window, and it was right then that we noticed the obvious and haunting sight of a full moon. Yes, we don't know what could have made that noise. Yes, there are farms around. It could have been a cow being attacked by coyotes or pretty much anything that happens in rural America. But I've never heard anything like it before or after. Jump forward about nine years, and I'm coming home late from work. As I'm driving, I see two bright orange eyes peering at me from the side of the dark road. I thought it may have been a fox or a dog, but as I got closer, I realized it was no average fox or dog. It was a massive, black wolf-like dog. This animal was so tall while on all fours that it seemed to be almost as tall as my car. Its back legs were almost kangaroo-like, very long and muscular looking, while the front legs were short and thin. It dashed across the road, and I was in front of my car, jumping the fence to the left of the road with almost no struggle. When I got home, I nonchalantly told my family that I finally got to see the werewolf that made that noise so many years ago. I don't necessarily believe that it's an actual werewolf, but I can't honestly say it isn't. This was the only paranormal experience I've ever had, probably the only one that I will ever have in my life, and it was one of the two most spiritual and terrifying experiences I have ever had. I am 26 years old, and this experience still scares me to this day. I will never forget walking out of that forest that night, and I will remember it for the rest of my life. Back in 2010, in Lower Mainland slash Fraser Valley, British Columbia, Canada, approximately in early October or mid-October when I was 16, I am 26 years old now, my old friend lived in the northwest rural part of my city, and his backyard had five acres of forest with a few houses surrounded in the distance around the outskirts of the five acres. Me and him would go and explore the forest all the time because it was quite mystical and just a cool place to wander and explore. This one time me and my friend went outside to his forest with his black Labrador retriever like we would usually do in the daytime down to the creek, but this time at night in his backyard forest at about 1am to go explore and smoke a joint like usual, we were sober at the time and didn't even get to smoking because of encountering the being and being terrified, so we ended up smoking it inside his basement slash room. You go out the back door into the backyard, and the five acre forest forms a natural sun trap. There is a specific entrance, which is a densely forested or bushed area you have to go through instead of going through rough terrain. You can't get through because the forest has a deer fence going across it, except for the entrance to the forest area. There is a proper, safe natural path to take down to the bottom of the forest and the creek. There's a steep tearaway out of the forest floor when you first walk in. It is only about 20 to 25 feet into the forest area from the entrance of the forest. When we were standing at the top of the cliff slash tearaway before the pathway leading down to the rest of the forest and the creek at the bottom, which was the only safe way to walk down, especially at night, I could see a 7-8 foot tall, pure white, soft looking figure about 30 to 40 feet downwards in the forest, and as I focused more, it was in between the trees, moving around softly, swaying left to right back and forth, slowly standing, touching the forest floor, in the exact same place the whole time we saw it, making absolutely no sound, and there was absolutely no wind. I wasn't even going to say anything about the figure to my friend at first because I was waiting for her to say something. We observed it for a couple seconds in complete silence, and we were mesmerized by its movements. Then I asked my friend if he saw it, and he said yeah, he could as well. We stood silent in fear as we watched it do its strange, unsettling, soft swaying movements, trying to adjust our eyes to the being and see what it was doing. As we continued watching it for a couple minutes, I felt I was in a slight daze watching it sway, and I started to feel impending doom set in, the sinking feeling, in my chest area, like when you are going to die or are in a life-threatening situation, and I had shivers going throughout my body. That's when I told my friend specifically, I don't like this, he agreed, and we left immediately. I wasn't so scared of the sight of the being, 
I was more curious about the strange movements it was making and what it really looked like. I was scared of the feeling of death it made me feel. I was frozen with fear, and I literally felt like I was going to die or something bad was going to happen. We left very quickly because we didn't know what it was, it scared us, and our intuition, my feeling of dread or death, told us it was dangerous. We didn't want to go check out what it was, and I knew it was time to leave. I remember my friend yelling something at it because he could tell his dog was scared. I am entirely positive the dog was whimpering and the being was just still swaying back and forth from left to right between the trees in the same exact spot. Almost immediately after we got out of the forest, we left the entrance of the forest, which we were not far from. It felt like a huge weight had been lifted off my shoulders, and the feeling of dread left pretty much immediately. It was so white that it looked like it was almost shining, but it wasn't because it wasn't giving off any light of any sort or illuminating the ground or trees around it. You could see the shadow being cast on it while it was swaying in the pitch black forest like it was a real animal. It appeared to be opaque, it looked solid enough to the point where you couldn't see through it at all, it was solid white. It appeared to be three-dimensional. It looked soft and kind of shiny, it was swaying left to right, right to left, with its two really long arms, it looked bulky or strong at the top and shoulder areas, where a head would be, but there was no head that I could see. The two long legs and arms looked like what the frontal view of an ape's forearms would look like when they were crawling on all fours, as if the two long legs were hunched in front. The best way I can describe it is seven to eight foot thick, separated curtains in the shape of an upside down V or you touching the forest floor and swaying left to right back and forth in a specific motion with no sound at all, absolutely no wind, and dead silence. Its movements were psychedelic and sort of hypnotizing. The texture of it was soft, like Charlie's white spirit entering Peter's body after the attic scene from Hereditary. Probably the most solid description I can give of what the texture of it looked like in person besides the Fresno Nightcrawler Yosemite video and the Ghosts of Gettysburg Triangular Fields video. It was making no sound at all while it was swaying. It was beautiful to look at and terrifying and unsettling at the same time. That's why it was so astonishing to look at, it was almost angelic. There were absolutely no sounds in the forest, it was dead silent while it was moving back and forth. Its movements could have been a lure of some sort because it did not move towards us or anywhere, or it was just letting us know to stay away because it was scared to death as well, or it just didn't want us to disturb it. It was literally something you would see in a science fiction horror movie. It was not a trick of the mind or light, there was no light or moonlight shining in the forest because it was filled with tall Douglas fir trees, cedar trees, and other vegetation, and the creature was downwards from us deeper in the pitch black forest. The forest also had various levelings and rough terrain in certain parts due to the natural tearaway in the ground when you first walked in, which consisted of a lot of clay at the bottom where the tearaway had occurred. The forest was on a downward slant when you first walked in, which is the pathway you took to get down safely where the creature was approximately standing. There was no possible way of any light even entering the forest, nor was there any light in close proximity. The houses were too far apart, and this forest goes down pretty steeply probably about 50 to 60 feet downwards till you get to the creek at the bottom. It was pitch black in that forest. It was not a spider web, fog, any sort of garbage, a weather balloon, a prankster, or material, as a couple of people have ignorantly and stupidly suggested. We had gone back in the morning daylight to the approximate area where we thought it was standing and saw nothing out of the ordinary. We even looked for prints, but there was nothing we could notice. It was also difficult because the ground was thickly covered in Douglas fir needles and other debris, his forest was in pristine condition because no one would ever go in it, as it is a private forest located in people's backyards. It is a quiet part of town, and people don't just go walking about everywhere like in the city. There were no houses close enough to give off any light or give off a shine through the trees, and the being was not see-through, it looked like it was almost solid, but it was very ghostly or spirit-looking as well. It was upside down V or U-shaped, and it had no facial features or head at all from what we could see in the dark. There are absolutely no animals in northern British Columbia, Canada, or the rest of Canada and the US that look close to what we saw, there are absolutely no animals that are 7 to 8 feet tall and stand on two legs. There aren't even any animals in other countries that come close to what we saw. It did not have a body, its two legs or limbs were its body. It was not an animal, and there is no possible way to debunk this. I have explored all the options for what it could have been. This was the first time we ever went out to his forest at night, and it was the last time we ever went into the forest at night. The five acres of forest are the biggest area of wood in that area. Around the area of town, it is mostly just a couple million dollar houses and farm slash forest area. It is pretty much the green belt of my city. He has no neighbors that are close to the location because, as I said, his forest is five acres, with the closest neighbors being at least three blocks down the street on the right-hand side of the forest. 
To this day, the feeling that I had when I saw the being move still gives me shivers, and I feel lucky to be alive. The fact that we went out to the forest at that time really late at night and happened to see that freaks me out as well, because it was clearly meant to be seen by us. If we had gone out any later or any sooner, we might not have seen it in his forest at that moment. Like I said, I didn't have to point out to my friend where the being was, he automatically saw it at the same time I saw it. I think the feeling of dread could have possibly been a warning to keep away from it, and that is why me and my friend left right away without any hesitation. Like I said, this was the only paranormal experience I have ever had. There was no paranormal activity that I experienced when I would go to my friend's house, on his property, or in his forest. Besides the one experience or encounter, my friend never mentioned seeing anything strange or having any paranormal experiences in or around his house prior to our encounter. Now that I think back on the whole experience of hanging outside there and exploring the woods, there is for sure something special about the whole location. I understand a lot of people are scared of these types of things and don't want to believe they exist, but you would have had to be there yourself to understand what it looked like, see the creeping movements, and feel what I felt. Seeing one of these beings up close is a spiritual experience that you need to experience and see for yourself to really understand what it was like. We have scaled my friend's forest around the creek area in the area where we saw the supernatural being at least 20 different times or different days beforehand seeing it, and we went back the day after to the exact spot where we saw the supernatural being in the forest and noticed nothing out of the ordinary. We both knew that it was some sort of being, and it was something we shouldn't have been seeing or attempting to go up to. A Duende, Gnome, story. My mother used to tell me a story that happened to her when she was a little girl, and all her brothers, sisters, and my grandmother can attest to this story as a real event in their family's history. Growing up in the yet-to-be-developed country of the Philippines in the early 1960s, my mom experienced a simple yet idyllic childhood. Modern technology has yet to reach a predominantly agrarian society, and children played outside in the farm fields to their heart's content. Siestas, or afternoon naps, are also a normal occurrence in most Filipino households, though my mom had other plans for this time of the day. One day, when the rest of the family had gone to rest, my mom, not older than seven years of age, snuck out to continue playing in my grandfather's fields. She had apparently befriended a race of duendes, dwarves or gnomes, and they had taken a liking to her. That same night, at the stroke of midnight, my mom suddenly went into a dreamlike state that lasted as long as their family grandfather's clock's twelve chimes. Much of what she saw burned itself into her memory, like a mental tattoo, and with every retelling, the details remain unchanged. In this dreamlike state, she would see a kingdom in the distance, a castle with tall spires and walls of stone. She found herself standing in some sort of vast courtyard made of interlocking stone bricks. In front of her appeared three duendes, a man, a woman, and an old man. They all had happy expressions on their faces, and they would beckon for her to come to them. The old man would try to give her a vial containing some sort of liquid, probably for her to drink. My mom did not take one step and would eventually be taken out of her trance by her frantic mother, my grandmother. Apparently, while entranced, she would cower in the corner of their bedroom, crying out, Don't take me. Don't take me. This trance occurred nightly for an entire week. My mom would enter the dream state at the stroke of midnight and would encounter the same beings. More and more would appear until, finally, an entire population of duendes would appear and dance around the courtyard, beckoning for her to come with them. The old man continued to offer her this vial, and my mom would refuse every night. After a week, it was the last straw, and she had angered the duendes with her refusal of their offer for the last time. What happened to my mom was very bizarre indeed, and if the topic of this story were brought up around her family, they would recount how weird things got and how scared they had been to experience it. Firstly, my mom lost all the hair on her head. Then she got all sorts of sores and boils all over her body. My grandparents had taken her to the doctor, but they had no explanation or remedy for my mom's ailments. That was when they decided to take her to a witch doctor. The witch doctor performed a ritual involving dripping wax from a candle into a large bowl of water. The wax formed itself into the image of a duende, and everyone's suspicions had been confirmed. They were instructed by the witch doctor to make an offering to appease the angry spirits. This involved sprinkling blood from a slaughtered chicken and the blessing of the land by a Catholic priest. As soon as they had completed the rituals, my mom's health had gone back to normal, and her hair had started to grow back. Now it's easy to dismiss this story as the imagination of a little girl running amok, but some details of the story are inexplicable. Firstly, my mom had no prior experience of having seen the dwarf image in books, television, or movies, and yet she had described them as looking like how the classic depictions of dwarves do, short, wearing simple, muted colored clothing of an unknown material, and wearing a pointed hat. Secondly, 
How bizarre was it that all those horrific things only happened to my mom right after her refusal to follow them into their land? Who knows what could have happened to my mom had she taken what they were trying to offer her? Could she have been spirited away into a realm of existence invisible to man, never to be seen again? Could she have been granted some sort of power? Sometimes we have a chuckle about it and say, it could have been a cure for cancer, and you didn't take it or attribute my mom's height, she's 4 feet 9 inches, to the Duende's doing. From time to time, we still ponder what fate had in store for that whimsical little girl playing in those fields in the 1960s, had the Duendes succeeded in their plan.